Okay, so there should be an echo if I speak. Do you hear an echo now? I'm going to close the window. Uh, I don't really hear an echo, but okay. But it says it's now streaming live. I heard an echo, Stephanie. Hello, Christine. Thank you. <laughs> I'm getting to be, you know, really good at this. This is session number three for me. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Uh -huh. It's uh. <laughs> It's one o'clock and I didn't leave any time for logistics. So um, welcome to the Climate Variability and Change Working Group uh, meeting. So we have a lot of excellent talks lined up this afternoon. Uh, this is being streamed live on YouTube and also the chat will be saved and that includes any private chats you might make. They're downloaded as well when you do that. So for the speakers, you have a 10 minute slot leaving two minutes for questions. We'll give you a warning at eight minutes and then we'll stop you at 10. Um, so Aishu is going to chair the first session. Aishu? Okay. Um, now let's start the meeting. As I said, the meeting, the talk will be 10 minutes and with two minutes question. I will give you a eight minutes warning. And before we start, I would like also take this opportunity to thank Gary Neal for his long uh, lead leadership role in this working group and congratulate him for winning the CSM Distinguished Achievement Award. And also I would like to thank uh, Sean Pingxi and Pierre Collector for their service for this um, group. And they stepped down in the screen and welcome Sarah and Larson to join the CVC working group co-chair. Now, our first uh, speaker is uh, Nicole Meher. Okay, uh, she was talking about uh, the ENSO and uh, PDV. Nicole, uh, Nicola, okay, now go ahead. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay, great. So I'm going to ask the question today whether Pacific decadal variability can modulate ENSO teleconnections over North America. And this is work I'm doing with Jen Kay and Antoinette Capitondi. Okay, so in the figure here, you can see ENSO teleconnections, and this is the maximum regression of temperature on the left and precipitation on the right onto the ENSO index from Tashedo et al. 2020. And you can see that ENSO has global teleconnections and over North America, El Ninos tend to cause cold wet conditions over the Southwest US, North of Mexico and the Gulf Coast and warm anomalies over Alaska, Alaska and Western Canada. Okay, so previous work has suggested that the PDV can modulate ENSO teleconnections over North America. And there's been a lot of local studies, including one that suggests that the PDV can change ENSO teleconnections over the Colorado River Basin by changing their spatial, um, I guess their spatial imprint, and then uh, this can actually change the sign of what you see. Um, so the aim of my study is to investigate this modulation in five large ensembles. Um, and we're using large ensembles because we have lots and lots of events that we can composite over and truly tease out the role of each of these modes of variability. Okay, so the first question we want to ask is, can the models actually represent ENSO teleconnections? So the figure you see here on the top in red and blue shows temperature teleconnections and in the bottom in green and brown shows precipitation teleconnections. Uh, the observations are in the top left and I'm showing the ensemble member for each large ensemble that is most highly correlated with observations you can see that the temperature patterns in observations are generally well represented in all of the models, as are the precipitation patterns. However, the precipitation patterns are kind of a little bit less well represented over South America. I'll note that if we do the same thing where we use the highest correlated member for precipitation instead of temperature, this bias over South America looks a lot better, but the overall correlations are still lower for precipitation than temperature. Okay. The second question you might want to ask is, uh, can the models actually represent Pacific decadal variability? And today I'm going to use the PDO index or the Pacific decadal oscillation. 
And this figure is very similar to the previous one. We have observations in the top left and the highest correlated ensemble member for each model. You can see again, the overall pattern is well represented in all models, but we do see some biases, particularly in some of the models, including CSM over the Kuroshio region. And we do see this tropical Pacific cold tongue bias that's in the interannual and so signal as well in this decadal pattern. Okay, so let's jump straight into some results and try and answer the question, is our ENSO our teleconnections modulated by the PDO over North America? In the figure you can see here, each row is a different large ensemble with CSM large ensemble in the top row. And I show again, red and blue for temperature and uh, green and brown for precipitation. The left row of each uh, set of columns is El Nino's when the PDO is in a positive phase. And the right row is when El Nino when the PDO is in a negative phase. So we can see a few things here. First, the models generally agree on the large scale patterns, although there are definitely some local differences. Um, the temperature pattern is most strongly modulated over northern North America by the PDO. Precipitation is most strongly modulated over the western coastline by the PDO. And we do in some models see something happening um, off the eastern coastline as well. And we see the largest precipitation modulation is actually generally offshore. Okay, so now I'm going to use the CESM large ensemble to really delve into what we're seeing and why we're seeing it here. And so this is the winter DJF response. And again, you'll see temperature and precipitation in the top two rows. Here on the far left, we have El Nino's when the PDO is neutral. The second, row, uh, the second column is El Nino when the PDO is positive. The third column is El Nino when the PDO is negative. And on the far right, we have the El Nino's when the PDO is positive minus the negative. Okay, and so you can see those patterns I've already described for temperature and precipitation in the top two rows. The third row, so the pink and green, is the sea level pressure anomalies. And you can see this basically, this big pink blob is the Aleutian low. And what you can see here is when uh, the PDO is positive, the Aleutian low is uh, strengthened and moved a little bit to the west as compared to when the PDO is negative. We also see a small increase in the high pressure over the American continent. And this could be what's causing the temperature anomalies we see in the top row as we're bringing more warm air from the south where it's warmer up into the northern latitudes. Um, and this kind of small high pressure anomaly over the continent could also be causing less cold um, pressure events to happen over the northern north US. In the bottom row, we have the zonal mean, zonal wind. And I'll direct your attention to the bottom left panel first. Here, the black contours are the mean state and the colors are the anomalies for El Nino events when the PDO is neutral. And so you can see that the mean state um, the winds that kind of, or the jet that comes onto the coastline of North America is strengthened and shifted south when you have an El Nino event. If you then look at the far bottom right panel, you can see when the PDO is positive, we have a small strengthening of the jet around 30 degrees north, and this could be what's causing these precipitation anomalies in the second row. Okay, so the next question we can ask is, does this modulation continue into the spring? And I'm showing exactly the same figure here, but now for March, April, May. And you can see, particularly if you focus on the panels to the right, that there is some persistence into this season, but it's a lot weaker. I will note that if you use a different model, the GFDL SPM med model, you see a stronger persistence into spring than you do with the CSM large ensemble. Okay, so what's going on here? Is this some kind of superposition of modes or are we just seeing a linear combination of ENSO and the PDO? So here again, I show temperature, precipitation and sea level pressure. On the far left, we show El Nino composites when the PDO is neutral. And in the second column, it show PDO composites, positive composites when ENSO is neutral. And you can see that the PDO effect is much less strong than El Nino. And it's really cool to use large ensembles here because we can really separate out the two modes. In the third column, we just show uh, addition of the first two columns. So this is El Nino plus the PDO positive. 
And in the last column, I show the co-occurring events. And if you compare those last two columns, you can really see that most of what we're seeing is just a simple addition of the El Nino when the PDO is neutral and the PDO positive when El Nino is neutral. Okay, so how might this impact people? So instead of showing composites here, I'm showing regions and you're looking at the whole distribution of all of the events within the ensemble. Um, on the far left, I show Alaska for temperature. And here you can see the probability density function for blue when we have neutral, neutral, thanks. Uh, yellow when there's El Nino in a PDO neutral. Green when El Nino is with co-occurring with a PDO negative and red when El Nino is occurring with a PDO positive. And you can see here that compared to the neutral neutral distribution, the temperatures over Alaska are a little bit warmer when you have an El Nino. And then that effect is slightly larger when the PDO is positive and slightly less large when the PDO is negative. However, you can see that the majority of events are all over the place and you could, for any individual event, you could observe a whole bunch of things. Um, and this is really kind of like a mean effect. The middle column shows the same thing for the Colorado River Basin, and this is precipitation anomalies now. And here you can see that not much is going on. Um, there is potentially a small effect of El Ninos compared to the neutral phase, but the PDO doesn't really seem to be having much of an effect. And finally, if you look at the San, Di uh, San Diego, California, again, precipitation on the far right, you can see the strong effect of the El Nino compared to the neutral. So the neutral is blue and you can see that the distribution is definitely changed by an El Nino event. But you can also see that if there is an effect of the PDO, it's pretty low uh, by that clustering of the green, red and yellow. Okay, so what have we found? We found that the PDO does modulate ENSO teleconnections over North America, and the largest effects are for temperature over northern North America and precipitation on the western coastline. We find some persistence into spring, but this is somewhat model dependent by how strong this is. And most of what we're seeing can be explained by anomalies in the Aleutian Low and the zonal mean zonal winds. This effect is really also just a simple superposition of the PDO and ENSO in the models. And finally, if we look at the probability density functions, they show a lot of overlap. And so if you were looking at an individual event and saying, hey, we know the PDO is in this phase and we have an El Nino, that's unlikely to be able to predict exactly what we're going to see in any given year. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Questions? You can either type the questions in the chat or raise your hands. Gary? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. Technical is very interesting. I was just curious, um, do the amplitudes of El Nino's um, enter into this at all? Yeah, Relative so- to the phase of the PDO. Yeah, so we haven't actually looked into that. It's really just clustering of everything at this point. So we could, we could kind of separate into multiple amplitudes, but yeah, I haven't looked at that. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? No? Okay, now they will move to the next talk. Next one is given by Dr. Lei Zhang. They will talk about Indian Open Dipo and Enzo. Okay, Lei, go ahead. Okay, thanks, Ashia. Um, can you see my slide and my cursor? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, it's now full hello. screen. Uh, I don't know if you want to view the slideshow or... Oh, I. it is already the full screen. Maybe I can try oh, it okay. again. How about yeah, now? That, that's better. Okay. okay. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Lei Zhang, and I am a research associate working at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, here are the collaborators of this work. Uh, in this study, we analyzed the impact of Indian Ocean Dipole on El Nino Southern Oscillation. So IOD and ENSO are the two dominant interannual climate modes in the tropical Indo-Pacific region. Climatologically, the sea surface temperature is highest in the Indo-Pacific warm pool region, which drives large-scale winds converging toward here, 
But during El Nino, the Pacific worker situation is weakened, accompanied by substance anomalies over the maritime continent. Similarly, during positive Indian Ocean Dipole, there are uh, weakened Indian Ocean worker situation as well as dry anomalies in this region. So the positive IOD and El Nino are associated with similar rainfall and circulation anomalies. And naturally, people have found that these two can closely interact with each other. For example, a study by Anamala et al. in 2003 found that when they force an atmospheric model uh, with central and western Pacific warming, they find easterly wind anomalies over the tropical Indian Ocean. So this result suggests that El Nino can contribute to development of positive Indian Ocean dipole. On the other hand, Bahara and Yamagata in 2002 found that a partial cor correlation analysis between the dipole mode index and the sea level pressure with ENSO effectory mode shows higher sea level pressure during positive Indian Ocean dipole. This drives westerly wind anomalies over the tropical Pacific. So this result in, suggests that in turn, positive IOD can contribute to the development of El Nino. So clearly positive IOD and El Nino are, can interact and amplify each other. However, if you look at the observations, the relationship between IOD and ENSO is uh, a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, if you look at the 11 year running correlation between the two modes, you can clearly see this very strong decadal variation in the correlation. Um, although it is overall positive, during some decades, the correlation between the two is very weak and even become negative. And if you look at climate models, models tend to show similar decadal variations. Uh, for example, in 1967, uh, uh, the observations show that a positive Indian Ocean dipole actually co-occurs with La Nina instead of El Nino. So this suggests that the relationship between IOD and ENSO is very complicated and we have not fully understood it yet. Um, especially why some positive IODs co-occur with La Nina. In this study, we focus on investigating the impact of IOD on ENSO and hopefully our results will help us to better understand why events such as 1967 occur. So to achieve our research goal, we analyzed observational data, including ERSST version 3B and ERA 20C reanalysis. In addition to that, we also performed and analyzed the so-called Indian Ocean Pacemaker experiments in which we have restored Indian Ocean sea surface temperature to observed values. Meanwhile, we leave the oceans fully coupled to the atmosphere elsewhere. So we have 10 ensemble members by slightly perturbing the initial conditions and uh, ensemble average the results isolate the impact of the Indian Ocean sea surface temperature anomalies on global climate variability, using which in this study, we analyze the impact of IOD on ENSO. So first we selected all the observed positive IOD events, which is the X axis. And we analyzed the DGF mean Nino 3.4 index during those years uh, and compare observed values, which is blue, with the Nino 3.4 in the model, which is red. Um, we find this result very interesting because although the uh, positive IOD tends to cause or to contribute to El Nino because these red bars are positive, we do note that in some years, such as these three events, See, in the model, there are La Nina instead of El Nino. In other words, positive IOD indeed can cause La Nina. We find this result very intriguing and we want to understand why. Why the positive IOD e e uh, effect can be different between those two categories. So uh, to answer this question, we performed a composite analysis of these five years and these three years separately. And here is the result. In the top panel, this shows the SST anomaly and the surface wind anomaly during positive IOD that causes La Nina in the model. And the middle panel shows positive IOD that causes El Nino, and the bottom panel shows the differences between them. We find that the largest differences for the positive IOD are located at the one pole. 
uh, for instance, in during this category, it, this uh, positive IOD event, we find the largest warming located at the so-called Smokeland Ridge region. While during this kind of positive IOD event, largest warming is located at the Northwestern Tropical Indian Ocean. The difference between the two is even clearer if you look at the bottom panel. So the summer climate ridge warming drives not, uh, large scale northerly wind anomalies together with easterly wind anomalies in the tropics due to the anomalous zonal SSD gradient. This kind of positive IOD drives large scale anticyclonic wind anomaly, which extends to the Southeast Indian Ocean um, and cause northerly wind anomaly in this region. Because the background wind in this region is southerly, this wind weakens the background wind and cause SST warming off the west coast of Australia. In one of our recent study, we find that the Southeast Indian Ocean warming and the Central Pacific cooling are closely connected to each other and they can amplify each other through interbase interactions. The Southeast Indian Ocean warming can enhance Pacific trade winds and cause cooling. Pacific cooling can cause contribute to Southeast Indian Ocean warming through both oceanic and atmospheric teleconnections. So these results together suggest that during this kind of positive IOD with summer canal ridge warming, it can cause Southeast Indian Ocean warming, which then through interface interaction cause Pacific cooling and therefore causes La Nina in the pacemaker experiment. But during this kind of positive IOD, because it cannot cause Southeast Indian Ocean warming, it actually favors El Nino. To further prove our hypothesis, we performed additional atmospheric model experiments, um, which, is, which is forced using the two different positive IOD SST anomaly pattern. And these winds are the response to the two different SST anomaly patterns, one with some kind of rich warming and one without. Um, clearly during this kind of positive IOD, the uh, IOD can cause northerly wind anomalies here in this region. Again, it is against the mean state winds and therefore it favors SST warming. But mm -hmm. during this, okay, thanks. Um, but during this kind of positive IOD event, it actually causes north, uh, southerly wind anomalies, which enhance the background of winds and favors SST cooling. Because of this kind of different response in the Southeast Indian Ocean to the positive IOD forcing, this favors El Nino and this, uh, sorry, this favors La Nina and this favors El Nino. So to sum up, we find that a positive IOD not only contributes to El Nino, but it can also contribute to La Nina under some circumstances. Um, in particular, we find that a positive IOD with some kind of rich warming can induce south, uh, northerly wind anomalies off the west coast of Australia, causing Southeast Indian Ocean warming. Which, and this warming can further cause Pacific cooling or La Nina through interbasin interactions. This result actually explains why events such as 1967, when a positive IOD co-occurs La Nina happened in the past. And our results also, also suggest that uh, future studies that focus on IOD and so relationship should take into consideration the detailed SSD anomaly pattern of the IOD. Um, that is all. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Question. Hello? Um, I was just wondering in your pacemaker experiments, did you have all other forcings evolving and did you kind of take that into account somehow? Yeah, um, so in the PSMIGER experiment, we used um, historical forcing plus RCP 8.5 for uh, 1920 to 2005 and 2006 to 2019. Um, we removed the linear trend in, this, uh, in our results. We also tried to remove the regression onto the global mean surface temperature and both gave us very similar results. So we think that external forcing may not play a major role here. Uh, thanks, ladies. It was a very nice study. Um, so one question I have, so you have taken a very um, Western Pacific uh, centric view on this. Did you also look in those specific years when you, had, when you had the La Nina in conjunction with the IOD, positive IOD, did you also look at the state of the tropical Pacific and other possible 
um, extratropical influencing influences on the Pacific itself. Okay, yeah. Um, so I guess the question is because we include part of the Western Pacific, perhaps in the model, this can influence the ENSO. Well, I think uh, ENSO is not, it's, it's also um, uh, forced by uh, large scale influences. And so, the, you know, for the Indian Ocean to affect the Pacific, the Pacific needs to be in a proper state. And maybe like meridional modes or other extratropical influences need to be, um, you know, conducive to what, um, to the evolution of the system. So I was wondering if in those particular years, you also looked at the larger scale conditions. Um, yeah, yeah um, that's a good question. So um, because we are analyzing the uh, Indian Ocean pacemaker experiments and the ensemble average, average the results are mostly um, due to the Indian Ocean forcing. But um, I agree with you, it could be, it is also possible that Indian Ocean may affect some other region that then affect the Pacific. Uh, in other words, there may be another pathway through this instead of just the Southeast Indian Ocean. Um, but we haven't looked at that yet, um, but we can look at that in the future. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Luke. Now we move on to the next talk. We will give by Tim Chen Yung. We will talk about North Pacific IRT interaction. Oh, all right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yep, thank you. So, uh, my name is Shim Yu. I'm a PhD student at Colorado State University. Today, I'm going to be talking about the work that I've been doing recently, along with my advisor, Dave Thompson, um, and other, other collaborators at CSU, that is Van Telson, and also with Casey Patricio. So I'm looking at atmospheric response to um, extra tropical um, uh, SSD variability over the Western North Pacific using a set of simulations run on the CSM. So I'm gonna start with providing some background and motivations for this study. It is clear that atmospheric circulation can influence the extra tropical SSD variability through the surface heat fluxes and surface wind stresses. However, the atmospheric response to extratropical SSD variability is relatively subtle. Uh, the linear theories predict that any surface heat flux anomalies uh, in the middle latitude can be easily balanced by small changes in low level circulation due to relatively strong horizontal temperature gradient in the middle latitude. And the atmospheric uh, response in the middle latitude is even more complicated because of the strong internal variability and the risk uh, dependence of atmospheric response to mean jet position uh, and nonlinear feedbacks from extratropical eddies. Thus, theoretically, uh, the atmospheric response to extratropical uh, SSD variability is much more difficult to isolate and quantify. Nevertheless, a growing body of evidence su suggests that the extratropical SST can uh, play an active role in atmospheric circulation. So the recent observational study has suggested uh, two robust patterns of atmospheric circulation that associated with the uh, SST variability over the North Pacific and North Atlantic basins. In this study, uh, we focus on the North Pacific sector only. So if you look at the plot on your left, there are uh, high sea level pressure anomalies that uh, span much of the North Pacific basin. And these high pressure anomalies uh, peak a month before the SST anomalies. And it is associated with the northward warm temperature advection. Thus, this pattern is uh, consistent with the atmospheric forcing of the SST. And if you look at the plot on your right, there are uh, low sea level pressure anomalies that extend downstream of this Kuroshio Oyashio extension region. And this is uh, associated with the southward cold advection. Thus, this, this pattern is consistent with the atmospheric response to cooling of the SST. So in order to test the uh, observed lead relationships between the extratropical atmospheric circulation and uh, SSD variability, we assessed experiments run on two different configurations of the CSM. So the first type of uh, simulation is the fully coupled AOGCM, which the atmosphere model is coupled to a fully active ocean um, with SSD evolving by internal physics of the SS ocean model. So here we can assume the both two-way feedbacks between the atmosphere and ocean 
are included in the coupled simulation. And the second one is a prescribed SSD experiment, uh, which is an atmosphere model standalone simulation forced by data ocean. So we refer to COGA runs, denoting Kuroshio, Oyashio SSTs and global atmosphere simulation. Here the simulation uh, is forced by time varying historical SSTs over the Western North Pacific and also with annually repeating climatological seasonal cycle over all other regions. So if you think about the coupling between a uh, data ocean and atmosphere circulation, you, you'd expect the atmospheric response to the uh, SSD forcing, but not the atmospheric forcing of the SSD because SS, SSD fields are given uh, by the data and is fixed. So this shows the, uh, the pattern of SSD anomalies that used to force the COGA simulations. So you can see the uh, largest SSD anomalies are focused on the uh, Kuroshio Oyashio extension region and said to be zero elsewhere. So there is no tropical forcing as well as uh, high latitude forcing. Here again, uh, you can see the regressions of SLP and SSD regressed onto the uh, SSD average over this Kuroshio Oyashio extension region. And the upper panels in the blue box are actually the plots that I've shown before. So uh, these are the results from the ERA5, so you can kind of work as reference. And then the left column uh, shows the negative leg, which is the uh, atmospheric, which shows atmospheric circulation pattern prior to the peak of the SST anomalies. And the right column shows the uh, positive leg, which is the case for SST is leading the atmospheric circulation pattern. So just to reveal, there is anticyclonic anomalies at negative leg uh, is associated with the northward warm temperature direction. And this pattern is consistent with the uh, atmospheric forcing of the SST. And if you look at the upper right, uh, there are low sea level pressure anomalies uh, that lags the peak of the SST anomaly by a month. And it is consistent with the uh, atmospheric response to the cooling of the SSTs. Uh, so the lower panels in the red box are the result from the coupled AOGCM. So if you compare the upper panels and uh, the lower panels, you can see the uh, results results from the observations and the coupled AOGCMs are actually very similar to each other. So we can see both the atmospheric forcing pattern as well as atmospheric response pattern uh, are well, well represented in the coupled AOGCM. Although the amplitude of these low pressure anomalies are already weaker in the simulation than in the observation. Now the uh, upper panels in the blue box are the same as the previous slide, but the uh, lower panels in the red box are the results from the COGA runs. So if you look at the left column, uh, there is no distinct atmospheric forcing pattern shown in the negative leg of the COGA simulation. This is expected because the SSTs are given as data and thus the uh, low level temperature direction by atmosphere is incapable of influencing the SSD field. Rather, uh, the results from COGA runs show the this low pressure anomalies at all legs. And by construction, atmospheric patterns shown in the COGAS runs are all representing the atmospheric response to the prescribed SSD forcing. So this close similarity between the um, atmospheric response pattern at COGAS run and the inferred atmospheric response at uh, positive lag in the observation suggests that the latter pattern is actually the atmospheric response to the local SSD anomalies over the Western North Pacific region. So our interpretation of atmospheric uh, circulation pattern is further supported by attendant changes in surface heat fluxes. Here, uh, surface heat fluxes are defined as a sum of sensible and latent heat fluxes. So uh, this plot shows the product of SST and uh, surface heat fluxes. So, so the uh, regions with positive values indicate the area with the warming of SST through the downward surface heat fluxes from atmosphere into the ocean mix layer. And the regions with negative values show the area with um, cooling of SST through the upper surface fluxes from ocean into the atmosphere. So if you look at the uh, left two columns in the upper panels, uh, the result, result from the observations and the coupled AOGCM um, shows that the, uh, at negative leg, there is a warming of ocean mixed layer uh, through the downward surface fluxes, uh, fluxing from atmosphere yep, thank you, uh, into the ocean. 
And at positive lag, uh, there is a cooling of SST associated with the over effluxes from ocean into the atmosphere. So at negative lag, the atmosphere circulation pattern is consistent with the atmosphere forcing of uh, SST. And again, at positive lag, uh, atmospheric circulation pattern represents the atmospheric response to uh, over effluxes. And if you look at the right column, the COGA results uh, show the over fluxes at all legs. Thus, uh, the atmospheric pattern shown in COGA results are again consistent with the atmospheric response to the over uh, fluxes. Heat fluxes. And uh, to summarize, uh, the observed characteristic of atmosphere ocean coupling in the North Pacific are fairly well captured by the coupled AOGCM and the atmospheric response pattern inferred from both the observations and the coupled AOGCM is recovered in the prescribed COGA experiment. And the response pattern is highly robust in uh, the observations and the coupled AOGCM and the COGA experiment. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any of your questions. Thank you. Questions? There's one in the chat. Not yet. Is Robert? Do you want to answer your question? Oh. Um, I, I can't read the chat. Sorry. Uh. Need to, I, uh, yeah, oh, I no. guess I had the same question. So some, some people have shown that the atmospheric response to North Pacific SST anomalies could depend a lot on resolution. What resolution are you using, and are you planning to investigate the sensitivity to resolution? Yeah, yeah. I, I know that Smirno paper showed the uh, the atmospheric response pattern, especially at the vertical extent, depending a lot on the uh, resolution. I tested this with uh, one degree and two degree standard resolution only, and I, and the response pattern was confined to the lower levels, like below 700 hectopascal. I think is consistent with the low resolution version of the uh, similar dog experiment. Uh, but yeah, I don't think I can do the high resolution experiment again, but yeah, at least within the standard resolution, uh, it didn't, it, uh, it wasn't sensitive to the resolution of the atmosphere. Okay, thank you. And then we move on. Next, I will give by Qing Hua Jing. Um, this stream and the tropical Pacific convection. Okay, Qinghua, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, the first I'd like to thank the uh, appreciate the contribution from my collaborator. I put the name there, so I have no time to read. So, and you can see uh, this is a teamwork and uh, the main goal is very straightforward, uh, just to try to understand this, the so-called uh, uh, enhanced jet stream waviness feature uh, observed over the past 40, uh, 40 years. And uh, the consensus of the com uh, community is something like the, uh, some study tried to argue this is the enhanced jet stream waviness in, mainly in, in Northern Hemisphere. Uh, it's mainly driven by this the Arctic amplification or CO2 induced AA effect. Uh, the idea is the AA effect uh, is warmer, is faster than the global mean temperature that can reduce the uh, north, uh, like a tropical, uh, tropical uh, Arctic temperature gradient. So that can uh, reduce this, the enhances the waviness and reduce the jet. But uh, here we try to argue uh, over the same time, over the past 40 years, uh, not only AA is the uh, prominent, but at the same time, there is the cooling phase of the, uh, the IP, uh, IPO interdecadal Pacific oscillation uh, staying in some like a cooling phase that may also uh, can reduce the temperature gradient because the, it's a tug of war uh, scenario, like, like the Arctic warming can reduce the temperature gradient. But if there's an internal IPO cooling signal, the, the, this signal can also reduce temperature gradient. So we try to argue probably, uh, we try to give an alternative uh, perspective to explain the same thing that is the, this internal or we call a surprise, the ITCZ convection uh, during the summertime could also uh, uh, contribute to this uh, reduction of the jet stream uh, waving, uh, uh, enhanced waviness, but reduce the, the strength of the jet stream, something like that. And we use a model and some like the like in-house uh, like experiment to prove this. 
and show this is probably uh, another way to explain this feature. And from the, in the right hand side, you can see there's a, like the six a panel, uh, oh, sorry, six panel. And the, so this six panel, there's a six, uh, seven panel. And this is the trend of the JJA Z200 from ERA5. And with, we're using this one to show you, uh, actually there, uh, this webinar is enhanced uh, indeed over the past four years along the jet stream, uh, Northern Hemisphere in summertime. So you can see there's a high, low, high pressure, high, low, high chain of a high, low, high pressure. Uh, uh, anomaly and uh, the pattern. And if you remove the zoonomic component, this wave, wave chain structure is uh, become more clear. And uh, so, but if you look at the trend of the Meridiano wind, you can find there's a lot of uh, like enhanced waveness along the jet stream. And this is a zoonomic component of the Z200. So you can see the maximum height rise uh, uh, in terms of a zoonomic components is all, uh, uh, located over the 40 degree north, just along the jet. And at the same time, uh, meanwhile, if you look at the, the trend of the uh, JJA SIT uh, for like 40 years, you can find that there's a global warming signal very clear, but also there's like the like internal cooling. So we, th we think this is probably due to IPO, chain, IPO phase, uh, shifting to this cooling phase. And this is a called a non-global SIT, just uh, using this trend to subtract uh, a global average uh, warming signal. So you can see there's a clear cooling phase over uh, Eastern Pacific. And here is a precipitation, just like a JJA trend over the same period. So you can see a uh, clear is a draining. So it's a shading, means it's a draining of like ITCZ along this the ITCZ uh, position. And there's another uh, warming, uh, increase of precipitation, not warming, increase of precipitation, moistening, or is a maritime, maritime continent or is part. So we think of this, structure is important to, to maybe contribute to this waveness, enhance the waveness. So then we first thing we want to check is this uh, external faulting, a historical run from uh, different sources, like the historical CSM1, large ensemble, 40 member, add them together, same layout as a previous one, and the seven panel, and the same variable, same, uh, same uh, non-global, non-zonal things, and the CMB5 historical run, 30 model, and 35 uh, CMB6 model, we put all together. So you can, yeah, it's really busy, but you can clearly see that the main point is that the first thing is, uh, uh, tropical SIT cooling model cannot capture, and just a model if uh, uh, the raw day, raw trend or non-global or give like El Nino-like pattern, uh, no matter in CMIC5, CMIC6, CMIC6 not as strong, but uh, CSM pretty strong. And the rainfall change is like the increase, like the ITCZ, but uh, in the observation we, feel, we see this a decrease of ITC, a decrease of surprise of convection along ITCZ. And uh, another thing is waveness. The waveness, we don't see very clear waveness. If you if you want to using like the non-zonal Z200 or Mariano wind to quantify that, we see that the magnitude is much smaller than observation. And in observation is something like the, this, the unit here is a per decade. So it's like the one meter per second per, uh, per decade. And here is like the 10. But if you look at the multi-model main, so you see the non-zonal is not as strong as CMB5, CMB6, CMB6 improve a little bit can capture this awareness a little, but it's much weaker. It's one, uh, one, one third of the observed value magnitude and the, wind, the Mariano wind not that strong. And the CSM1 shows some waveness here, but not so uh, connected through, uh, throughout this uh, the, uh, along the jet. Another thing we see is a zoonomic component, uh, 40 member average or all mem member average, it seems like the uh, overestimate a uh, tropical warming because you see it or it's a high to rise is uh, much stronger than observation. Observation is, is uh, the red one. This red one just uh, simply copy from this plot, from this is curve, this line. Uh, so idea here is that external, uh, so another thing I like to argue is they see the Arctic warming is also well captured. So by or it's a model because this AA can tr easily trigger by this uh, CO2 increase. But uh, when the AA uh, is uh, present and uh, Arctic C uh, CO2 forcing is uh, strong, but uh, this enhanced waveness is not that clear. So we think to, probably due to this, the, uh, the, a little bit bias the simulation of a tropical convection because in the observation, we see there's the cooling signal or drying ITCZ, but the model give us, CO2 forcing give us like the, uh, the wetting uh, signal there. So we think the internal tropical acidity cooling just like IPO related is, uh, is important, but we use two approach to prove that. 
The first one is we just using model itself. We don't do any like the in-house experiment. So we just simply get a free run, no CO2 false in there, just like a long control run and uh, a trimmed to very short four years period. So that can compare with observation. So we have many, many like a sliding window. We have many, many like the uh, like a four years of period. So we constrain, so we ask uh, this model have to capture its weaveness by using like a spatial correlation to constrain that one. So we find some member really capture its weaveness. And some 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 member uh, capture like opposite face like the blue one, and we compile that is a red one minus the blue one. So we want to see because we our constraint only over along the jet like a twenty north to, to sixty north. So we want to see that what uh, would happen outside of is the mid latitude. So we want to see. Uh, if a model by chance captures a waviness, because we ask a model to do this, right? We force model to capture this uh, by design, and we want to see what happened, uh, what would happen outside in the Arctic and in the tropics. But what we see is all these members give us the picture that, like that, all member tend to have a cooling uh, in, in the tropics, like, like IPO, and the drying like, along ITCZ, and no uh, article warming. So, so this tells us something like the, in this model world, uh, so, uh, AA is not necessary. And uh, it's an internal cooling become more important uh, to, to, to uh, concurrent with this uh, uh, enhanced awareness. We also looked for a member historical run because we, we know uh, in that moment doesn't do, doesn't do well to capture this enhanced awareness. But if, you looked at, if we looked at individual members, some members still do uh, do better than other members. So this is a really, sorry. Oh, oh so, so, so it's the same thing. Like the, if a model by chance capture internal cooling can also capture uh, well, it's uh, really nice. So we want to, so this is the last two plot is that, so we think that the tropical cooling may help to reduce the temperature gradient. So this is observation, this is the model, and it's a difference. We find this a cooling, right? And we think this is a drying, this is a precipitation difference, ERA minus ESM, large example. So it's still, this cooling may help. So this is my last slide. So we do some like experiment. We just put this pattern, ITC, this suppression, and this enhanced maritime continent. Uh, like the precipitation in the model, just in CSM1 and compare control and this, it's just like a snapshot model, the one year run and the 10 members and uh, uh, compare with the control run. And this is a precipitation chain and this weakness. So we find the model can capture this weakness if you compare with observation, not completely, but uh, uh, roughly capture like enhanced weakness. So this is our cartoon, uh, summarize our uh, main idea is that uh, this ITCZ shift due to this IPO cooling and generate some waveness. And this maybe there's like a jet stream favors the uh, barotropic instability uh, enhancement and favors the, the waveness. So there are two things. One thing is the cooling favor, uh, weaken this temperature gradient, but same time this, the, this the tropical precipitation change may also favor is the generation of the wave pattern. Yeah, so this is the, the whole story. Thank you. Thank you. Um, question? I was just wondering if you looked at the AMEP runs or the pacemaker runs to see if prescribing the SSTs gives you the waviness trends. Okay, thank you. I, I will. I will. I would like to do that, but I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, the sum run is to also add a CO2 together at the same time. So we want mm -hmm. to use some AMEP run with uh, adding a tropical SSD only. So yeah, I will check the uh, data yeah. archive to make sure. I mean, I guess I guess comparing them with the with the large ensemble would. Um, the large ensemble doesn't get it, then the CO2 is not, not doing it, right? No, because we, we have 10 member ensembles of the go go runs. Okay, thank you. Okay, there's no other question. So we move ahead to the desktop. This I will give a new phone jump on the surface equation change of the top of in the warmer than a new phone. So you go ahead. Hi, uh, so I just share my screen. Mm. Can you see my screen now? Uh, yes, it's not in the... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, today my talk 
talk is uh, are they are not huh? what's going on? Uh, are there surface circulation change of the tropical Atlantic Ocean in a warming climate? Uh, this study it worked with Will Perry and John Sano at Bedford Institute of Oceanography. Uh, the reason why we care about this question is that the surface wind is one important uh, driving force for ocean modeling. Uh, however, semi-five climate uh, scenario results show that there is a uh, increase a robust increased precipitation of the RTC region, but there is no much change in the surface wind and the sea level pressure. Um, it is a similar phenomenon in summer. So, uh, however, if we look at the um, if we look at the observed sea level pressure signal trend, uh, we can see there is a, a decreased sea level pressure anomaly over the tropical Atlantic Ocean. And the AMIPU uh, experiment also suggests uh, decreased the sea level pressure, uh, sea level pla sea decreased the sea level pressure over the tropical, uh, uh, tropical Atlantic Ocean, uh, while the, there's no much change in the simplified or climate model. Um, it suggests uh, that there's a very large uncertainty in the changes of the surface circulation of the tropical Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it could be due to the competing effect, uh, such as the uh, uh, summer dynamics effect over warm atmosphere, uh, and the circulation change, such as the hard cell expansion or the changes in the storm track. Uh, in our project, uh, we conduct uh, several downscale simulation of North Atlantic uh, climate using uh, polar wolf, uh, driven by Hadley Center assistant model and uh, CSM4, uh, following uh, three scenarios RCP 8.5, 4.5, and 2.6. Um, we get some <laughs> interesting results um, regarding the surface circulation of the tropical o Atlantic Ocean. That's the reason why <laughs> I gave this talk. Uh, the upper panel shows the, uh, the first uh, wolf domain. Uh, the reason why I choose such domain is to cover the ocean, ocean domain that is shown by this red box. Uh, to save the computing time, uh, I try to minimize my model grade. So the source boundary of my model domain is located over the ITCZ region. Uh, the result prove it is not a good idea. So I build uh, the second wolf domain to cover the ITCZ uh, region, although it is not fully cover the ITCZ, but it works for our uh, regional, um, regional oceanic modeling. Uh, so this second domain is NA2, the first domain is NA1. Uh, in the next several slides, I will show some downscaling skinny result. Uh, first, let's look at the precipitation uh, from the Hadley Center's result, model result and the wolf down skinny result uh, in the historic and the three, three RCP scenarios. We can see um, Worf did a fairly good job of the extra tropical uh, pre pre precipitation zone uh, compared with the Hadley Center's model result. Uh, however, the ITCD in Worf is unable to develop. Uh, that's, so, we, so when we look at the difference uh, plot between RCP minus historic scenario, uh, we can see uh, there's, uh, there, there's no much signal uh, of the precipitation um, of the ITCD region in Wolf uh, compared to a very robust increased precipitation uh, of the ITCD region. Um, this slide shows uh, the downscaling result drawn by CCSM4 RCP 2.5. When we look at the pre pre precipitation result from two wolf simulation over these two wolf domain, we can see it's similar. Uh, the wolf did a fairly good job 
of the uh, in the precession of the extratropical region. <laughs> but the IDC in this smaller wolf domain is unable to develop. And the IDC uh, in the second wolf domain it de uh, develops, but it's very it's much later uh, compared with the CCS compared with the CCSM for model result. Uh, then we look at the difference plot between RCP minus the historical scenario. Uh, we can see it's a very similar uh, situation. A wolf, wolf, uh, two wolf simulation uh, shows a similar uh, pre precipitation changes over the actual tropical region uh, compared with the CCSM4 result. But over the ITC region, um, there is an increased precipitation in the world for NA2 result, but it, uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is still very narrow, uh, narrow, narrow um, uh, range compared to the CCSM4 result. Uh, then this slide shows the response of the atmospheric circulation. Uh, the first three columns shows um, uh, down skinny result driven by hard data centers uh, or system model. Uh, the first column shows the down skinny result driven by CCSM4. Uh, the upper panel shows pre uh, precipitation change. Uh, the middle and bottom panel shows uh, uh, geopotential high change at uh, five, 500 millibar and 200 millibar. Uh, so first, let's focus on this increased uh, precipitation of the subtropical uh, Western Atlantic Ocean. Um, we can see this 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 change in the precipitation are comparable among these three uh, scenarios. Um, however, we can see um, we can see this is a kind of different. Uh, Different uh, changes in the in the 500 geo potential high um, among these three scenarios. Uh, that's because the increased precipitation alone is uh, it uh, is consistent with the negative geo potential high change. But the warm uh, dynamic uh, summer dynamic effect of the atmosphere uh, will com uh, tend to compensate this negative geo potential high. Uh, as a result. This uh, uh, this uh, negative uh, geo potential high um, change becomes uh, more positive uh, with the RCPs. Um, the, uh, but over the uh, over the ITCD region, we can see the atmosphere just become warmer. The geo potential geo potential high become larger. Uh, it is a similar similar result um, from the dark skin result driven by CCSM4. Um, and uh, then I want to compare the two uh, simulation of the world uh, over the two different domain drawn by CCSM form. Uh, we can see there's a, a quite similar uh, precision change over the actual tropical region uh, from these two, uh, two wolf simulation. Uh, also, we can see the corresponding uh, change over the geopotential high at the 500 minibar and 200 minibar, just over this uh, western, uh, western subtropical Atlantic region. Um, mm -hmm. over Sorry, pardon me? Yeah. Uh, I don't get it. Thank you. I think you have two minutes left. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> the, uh, then I, uh, I want to show the signal pressure and the surface circulation changes uh, to, uh, I just uh, um, showed my, my talk. So um, we can we can see there's a there's a um, significant uh, uh, cyclonical sea level pressure change just uh, over the uh, subtropical uh, Western Atlantic Ocean that is corresponding to the increased uh, precipitation there. Uh, however, we also note that this robust negative uh, uh, sea level pressure change in this uh, uh, four wolf down skinning simulation. Um, but there's no such such a negative signal pressure anomaly uh, in this uh, wolf simulation of the large night domain. Um, we can see this this uh, uh, very big uh, uh, negative signal pressure anomaly is from the the intensification of this sub over this tropical node over the um, Western Africa. Uh, 
but it is not a physical, it is not a real response of the circulation in the warming climate. Um, I don't know why, but it must be related with the domain, southern boundary domain of the world. Uh, so uh, I just go my summary. The take home, take home lesson is that regional model domain boundary shouldn't uh, be located in the ITCZ. And the warmer, uh, weak surface circulation change in the equatorial Atlantic Ocean could be a result of the competing effect of a warmer atmosphere and the increased diabetic heating associated with the convection. Also, the changes in the hard cell and the ITCZ uh, will impact the climate of other regions. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, do we have any questions? Yeah, Isla? I'm sorry if you showed this and I missed it, but it, did you compare the circulation with the what was in the driving GCM? Like if the high resolution of WARF makes a big difference? Uh, yes, uh, the, basically the, uh, the result, uh, the GCM's result is similar with the result, WARF result of this large domain. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, this there, there's no such a large silo pressure anomaly over this uh, Western Africa region. It is uh, not a real. It is not a real response. Okay. I don't know why, but it uh, it it caused by the domain, so the boundary of the domain. Any other questions? All right, thanks, Minghong. Thank you. All right, and just a reminder, we're in session two, so long-term climate variability and change. Um, and so I'm your uh, uh, chair for this session, Sarah Larson. And so next we have uh, Yanan Duan, uh, evolution of long-term temperature trend and variability in CMIP-6 multimodal ensemble. Hello everyone, uh, my research topic is evaluation of the long-term temperature trend in CMIP-6 in two time period. We had already published this paper in geophysical research letters. The motivation and uh, objectives of, of this study is to um, conduct a robust assessment of the CMIP-6 climate model's ability to capture the observed and temperature trend and variability. And also we want to comment on the single large ensemble and the versus multi multimodal large, large ensemble's ability to capture the observed regional temperature trend and variability, especially in the sources US and the global continent. This table shows the models we use in this study. Until we close this paper, we already had um, 30, 33 ensemble member on the models and um, some are very large on the models and some are very small, only has, uh, only has one, um, only has one on the member. In this table, we, the second column, this column is the uh, temperature trend with the unit of Celsius per decade. And we also calculate the two standard deviation of the arrow. To test the significance of the trend, we calculate the long-term persistence and short-term persistence I will introduce it later. After that, we want to compare, uh, we want to calculate the pattern correlation within the individual model and also the model observations in order to get a general idea about the model accuracy. The data methods I used as I introduced in the formal slide, uh, we use CMIP6. We have 220 ensemble members from the 23 climate models and uh, th in this study, we um, use a method based on Kuma et al. 2030, uh, the paper published in Journal of Climate. Uh, and uh, we do some further study to um, discuss more about the CMIP6 properties. The long-term trend persistence calculation method is non-parametric trend estimation methods. The significant 
test, uh, significant test calculation is uh, calculation methods are long-term persistence and short-term persistence as introduced in the formal slide. We want to study the training two time periods. One is 1901 to 2014, another is uh, 1951 to 2014. Because the, as the following time series figures show, so within several, uh, several decades and within the 100 years, 100 years, the trend looks uh, very different compared with each other, especially in the sources US. I will uh, introduce more in the following slides. Here is the temperature. Here is the temperature normally in global continent region. We calculate the weighted average and uh, so we can find that the CMIP6 multimodal ensemble can capture the observed temperature normally at the global scale. It caused by the very large uncertainty structure in the CMIP6. I will discuss it further in, the, uh, in these slides. These slides, we compare the temperature increasing trend for the two periods. We find that the recent several decades, recent 64 years, the temperature trend increased much greater than the, than the long-term average, almost double the accelerated rate with uh, 0.2 compared with uh, 0 0.08. And also we find that the CMIP6 model can capture the regional scale reliability much better for the short-term period compared with a very long-term average. Then we calculate the trend pattern correlation between the, uh, within the individual model and uh, within the 220 ensemble models, the CMIP6, and also the model observation for each individual model to get some idea about the model accuracy. Globally, uh, they all of them are global continent results. Globally, the special pattern of the trends is the most similar among the ensemble members of the same model. Uh, it's much uh, greater than the intramodal comparison. The intramodal means we randomly selected the ensemble members from the 220. We take the same MP6 as a pool to calculate the intramodal pattern correlation. And uh, this one is a model. Uh, Model, model observation pattern correlation. So higher number represents the more accuracy we have. So for the random selected process, we repeat the process for 500 times, um, for 500 times. So the point represents the 500, 500 times average. And uh, here is a 95 percentile range of this uh, correlation. So we want to compare the multi-model large ensemble CMIP6 and also some single model with very large ensemble size. We want to compare the accuracy. The yellow, uh, this one is um, global uh, sources US uh, temperature normally average the time series from the 1901 to 2014. And uh, the yellow bar shows, the yellow band shows the, the failure zone where the uh, climate model cannot capture the observation. So the CMIP6 performance is much better than the single model light on them due to the large, very large uncertainty range. But it will increase another problem, the signal to noise uh, ratio problem. So I will introduce it later. In order to test the model signal to noise paradox problem, uh, because the model sometimes model can predict the observation much better but it is caused by the large uncertainty in the model itself. So we want to um, test the balance if it require it or not. The RPC is the origin of predictable component. This method is, is introduced in the signal to noise paradox in this paper. And uh, in this matrix, the uh, numerator is the correlation between the ensemble mean and observation. It means the model's ability to predict to capture the observation. The denominator is a model versus model correlation. It means model, model ability to predict itself. In the perfect situation, the RPC should be one, but we expect value to be smaller than one since 
the model can predict itself much better than to predict the observation. In this study, we use uh, five years running mean time to calculate the RPC. And to, in order to uh, test the significance of the RPC, we use uh, some, we use non hypothesis as the um, observed temperature trend and variability lie within the spread of the model ensemble. It means if we replace the observation with uh, any random selected model itself, the RPC should be the same. It means uh, the model can capture the observation. So we want this situation to be the truer case for the model we have. And uh, if we reject non hypothesis, it means if, if we replace it with a uh, model, the RPC should be different. It will be, uh, we will um, repeat the random select process 1,000 times. So we will show the 95% percent of range. Here is the results we have. This one is uh, semi p 6 and other is uh, ensemble models with a uh, member greater than 10, greater or equal, equal with 10. The, in the RPC, uh, RPC value, if the absolute value of RPC is greater than one, it means model can predict observation much better than predict itself. If the, it is smaller than one, it, uh, the inverse is right. The model can predict itself much better than predict the observation. So in this figure, the uh, rejection rate means the model cannot predict the observation uh, much better than predict itself. So the rejection rate always occurs in the, in the yellow range, yeah, yeah, in, the, in the yellow range. There's no wonder, well, there's no wonder sam 6 has a very low rejection rate because it can better predict the observation. And the, the same situation occurs in some very, in some relatively small single model, like the IPSL and the CNRM. Yeah, they have a much smaller ensemble size, IPSL only with 32 and also the CNRM, they only have um, 17, but the rejection rate is low enough so here, yeah, here is the references I use, and uh, this one is um, on level size and also on level size relation with a fraction of the rejection uh, re uh, of the rejection rate. Yeah, if we increase on level size, the rejection rate decrease as we expected. It seems like uh, if over sixty, um, it goes to saturation. That's it. Great, thanks. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, I can ask Ben. Um, have you been able to look at any of the downscaled versions of CMIP5 that are kind of geared towards looking at the more specific regional differences? Oh, no. No, no, yeah, it's a good suggestion. Yeah, we, yeah, for the resolution problem, yeah, uh, when we do another analysis about uh, CSM2 line ensemble, we find such problem with a different resolution, the results will be um, slightly different. Yeah, we need to do more in the future. Thank you for this. All right, any other questions? All right, we'll move on to the next talk. And so next we have um, Aishu Hu with variations in meridional overturning circulation and their influence on global ocean. Aishu, I think you're muted. Okay, now. Okay, I'm thinking about that show. It's not, oh, Sorry. perfect. Not, perfect. Okay. 
Uh, this work is in collaboration with uh, Jerry Mill, Nan Rosenblum, Ma Maria Molina, and, the, and the Gary Strand. Right now, the paper is under review um, by General Khan. The Atlantic Meridian Overtaining Circulation, or AMA, is a global scale ocean circulation which transports upper ocean warmer and saltier water into South Polar and North Atlantic, where this water loose heat becomes dense in sinkful depths and flows southward and up well elsewhere over the world ocean. Under present condition, there's no deep convection in the South Polar and North Pacific. But studies show that even the Pliocene about 2.5 to 5 million years ago, there might be an active both the AMAP and the Pacific Deep Meridian Overtaining Circulation, or PMAP. A similar model study showed that a strengthening of the AMAP can cause a weakening of the PMAP, and the strengthening of the PMAP and weakening of the AMAP to form a seesaw like variability. So, in this research, we asked two questions. One is whether AMAC and TMA form a natural pair of seesaw like variability between North Atlantic and North Pacific under modern day conditions. Two is how the AMAC's stability will influence the, the global scale ocean circulation. To do this, we use uh, CSM1 at one degree horizontal resolution carried out five experiments. For the first four experiments, we ran for 800 years, with spread water forcing on for 500 years and up for 300 years. For the last experiment, we ran the simulation for 300, 350 years, with spread water forcing on for 250 years and up for 100 years. In the first four experiments, additional spread water forcing is added into the south for the North Atlantic between 50 and 70 kilo north with a strength of 0.2 or 0.4 kilometers. This spread water forcing is compensated elsewhere in the world ocean for the global X environment and compensated at the north south polar north Pacific only in the MPEX environment. For the last one, we put a dinosaur salt in the south polar north Pacific, and this salt glass is compensated elsewhere of the world ocean. This is the derived AMAP and PMA. The definition of this index is uh, the maximum of the Atlantic meridional stream function below 5 meter depth for AMAC and the Pacific meridional stream function, the maximum below 5 meter depth for PIMA. We can see that in the first four experiments, both these simulations show a collapse of the AMAC. But when the fair water function comes in the North Pacific, the collapsing is slightly slower than that compensated by the global ocean. When the first water portion stops at year 500, the experiment with pond 2 water portion is recovered immediately, but with pond 4, it delayed by 100 years. But they, they both overshoot the concurrent strength and then recover. In the Pacific side, with the compensation in the global, there's no PMAC formation. The PMAC formation is only happened in the two experiments with the compensation at the North Pacific. That means the collapsing of AMAC itself will not automatically cause a setup of PMAC in our simulation. So to test a setup of PMAC whether it will affect the AMAC, we add a dinosaur salt in the south of the North Pacific to force the setup of PMAC. And then we look at the Atlantic, we do see a weakening of the AMAC by strengthening of the PMAC. That means if we force the AMAC to set up, it does affect the circulation in the Atlantic. This is a meridian stream function in a control run for the Atlantic and the Pacific. And this is in the experiment with the PMAC set up. We can see that in a control run, there's strong deep overtaining in the Atlantic, but closely absent in the Pacific. When PMAC set up, we see a similar meridian stream function in the Pacific as in the Atlantic in the control run. But right now, it's the, the AMAC closely in class. This change not only affects the deep circulation, it also affects the shallow circulation, such as the subtropical cell. In the control run, the Atlantic subtropical cell is weaker than that in the Pacific. 
when the A mark flies and the T mark is set up, we see the strengthening of the subtropical cell in the South Atlantic and the weakening of that in the North Atlantic. In the Pacific side, is the, with the setup of the T mark, the shallow opportunity circulation in the Pacific is a weakening in the South Pacific but strengthening in the North Pacific. Since the AMAC is a global scale organ circulation, the change of AMAC also affects the circulation in other places. We choose four as an example, Bering Street, in Lee's through flow, Big Passage, and Agatha Carlos. We can see that weakening of the AMAC causing a weakening of the, the Bering Street transport, and also weakening of the Lee's through flow, and the weakening of the Agatha Carlos, but a strengthening of the Big Passage transport. With the setup of the HEMA, the parent street transport is further weakened and also further weakened in media roof flow. But the effect on the above current is small. And the strengthening of the brick passage transport is also weaker when HEMA is set up. Next, I will show an example of how it affects the three dimensional ocean circulation. As uh, the changes of meridian flow at the 22 north in the Atlantic and the Pacific. This figure shows the Atlantic and side at 22 north in the control run and in the five experiment. In the control, this represents the northward flowing Gulf Stream. This represents the southward flowing return current of the AMAC. With collapsing of AMAC in this four experiment, we see very similar changes of the meridian flow in the Atlantic, a weakening of the Gulf Stream and the almost flat the southward return flow. In the preceding South experiment, we also see this weakening of the Gulf Stream and weakening of deep current. In the preceding side, with the, in the control run, we see this northward flowing control current. With the collapse in the AMA, Without the set of the schema, this a crucial current, the deeper part is strengthened and the surface actually is weakened. With the set of the schema, we see a significantly strengthened northward flowing crucial current, and also this a strong southward flowing western boundary current, which represents the return flow of the deep in the deeper part of the ocean. So in our experiment, basically, which we have four different states of AMAC and TMAC. Active AMAC and the inactive TMAC, which represents the modern day uh, condition. And inactive AMAC and inactive TMAC, which may represent the future climate condition due to global warming. And also we have a state is that we have active TMAC, but collapse the AMAC. This situation may represent a hundred event during the last dictatorship period. And the last one is we have active AMAC and active PMAC. This may represent the biosafe condition, but under our modern day condition, except this active AMAC and inactive PMAC state, the other three states are not stable. So in summary, the weakening of the AMAC will not automatically induce a strengthening of the PMAC. However, when PMAC is forced to set up, the strengthening or weakening of the PMAC will induce a weakening or strengthening of AMAC, which forms a CSLS variability. And AMAC is potentially uh, is positively related to a bearing tree, the need through flow, and other current, but negatively related to a brick passage transform. For the PMAC, it is uh, negatively related to bearing tree transport and the need through flow and also brick passage transform. Our results also show that the changes in PMAC and AMAC can also affect the global ocean circulation elsewhere. Thank you. Thanks for that perfect on-time finish. Um, we definitely have time for a few questions. Um, yeah, we have one from Gokhan. Yeah, I should, just a quick question. What is the mechanistic relationship between AMAC, PMAC and the uh, drink passage transport, how do they essentially impact each other? Well, drink passage transport is uh, 
when we weaken the AMAX, basically it causes a strengthening of the southern ocean vent, which strengthens the big size of Okay, so it's through the wind surface forcing, but not through the ocean stratification. Um, not exactly through ocean stratification, but on the other hand, is uh, with the uh, SQ AMA, there's uh, a flow from the Atlantic into the Pacific. It's about a few circles. That with the class AMA, that flow is beginning to weaken. Also, contribute to the strengthening of the big passage. But if it's small, that we can still see. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yeah, I had one. Um, you, you showed on one of your earlier slides that two of your experiments had a AMOC collapse and then they, uh, or there were three and then they had, there was this overshoot. Do you have any idea what's dictating the amplitude of that overshoot? Because it seems like each of those experiments goes to the same, close to, you know, 50 spare drugs. Um, yes, I have some idea is uh, when we have uh, the AMOC class because we use uh, this very strong forcing, it's just a pressure function on and off. So when we apply those forcing, some of the fresh water actually we put into the surface, it will transport into the sub surface. And then it basically stay there and they must collect. And when the fresh water forcing stops, we will have a initial start because of the cooling in the sub polar North, North Atlantic and it causes the strengthening in the AMAC. And that strengthening will cool more a bit saltier water actually from the subtropical Atlantic into the subpolar region, which is a compound effect with the subsurface water actually now is a bit of pressure. That's why it's overshoot. But why it exactly go to like a 50 slurge? And I haven't looked at that yet. All right, thanks. We'll move on to the next talk. The so next we have Xiaowei Li. Um, the title is The Effects of Historical Ozone Changes in Southern Ocean Heat Uptake and Storage. Yeah, thank you. Oh, can you see my slides? Uh, yeah, it looks good. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Xiaowei Li. I'm a PhD student from the University of California, Riverside. And today I'm going to talk about the effects of historic ozone changes in southern ocean heat uptake and storage. On this project, I collaborate with my advisor, um, Professor Willy, <coughs> and I also collaborate with Ke Willy and Shi Zhang from Australia. Uh, the left figure here shows the Antarctic ozone concentration as well as the ozone hole in 1978, in 1979 and in 2008. While the right figure here shows the time series of the average area of ozone hole. So we can find that due to human activities, the, Ant the Antarctic ozone hole has increased a lot in the past few decades. And as a kind of greenhouse gas, so the changes in ozone concentrations is supposed to affect the climate, particularly in the southern hemisphere. So in this project, we wanted to know what is the role of ozone changes in southern ocean climate change, particularly we focus on the southern ocean heat uptake and the storage. In this project, we use the ESM1 large ozone simulation, which consists of 42 ESM1 members with all historical forcings, and it is named as historical simulation. And meanwhile, we have another experiment, which is fixed ozone experiment, which consists of 80 ESM1 members. And the forcings are as in the CM1 large ensemble. However, the ozone concentrations, including both stratospheric ozone and the tropospheric ozone, are fixed at 1955 levels, and it is named as historic fixed ozone simulations. So in this project, we can analyze the effects of historic ozone changes during 1958 to 2005, by analyzing the difference between the two simulations here. And here are some of the results. Uh, we started with analyzing changes in the atmosphere. We can find that the ozone changes leads to very strong power intensification of the surface with, uh, of the surface wind stress. The root curve in panel B here, and the ozone induced changes contribute to about half of the historic uh, surface wind stress, the blue curve here. And the changes of the surface wind may alter the ocean, uh, may alter the wind-driven ocean circulation in the southern ocean, which is a decency. So we find that 
The alarming uh, modal laboratory circulation is also power shifted and also enhanced in this process. Meanwhile, we find that the eddy induced smoke is also enhanced in this process, which partially offset the alarming induced smoke that's producing a residual smoke. Generally follows changes in the alarming smoke with a power intensification in response to ozone changes. Besides the changes in ocean circulations, we find that the ozone changes can also alter the surface heat flux. And the panel A here shows the special pattern of changes in the net surface heat flux. So we find that generally in response to ozone changes, the ocean can absorb heat from the atmosphere, generally with a range of about 50 to 60 degrees south in, in the ocean, in Pacific, also in the Atlantic. And the only average changes in net surface heat flux is shown as the black curve in panel B here. So we find that the Southern Ocean gains heat from the atmosphere around 49 to 61 degrees south, but lose heat over 39 to 49 and also over 61 to 72 degrees south. And many heat fluxes can contribute to net change. So here we find that the ozone changes induce very strong short wave warming to the south about 55 degrees south. And the short wave warming is the composition between a reduced short wave reflection, the curl curve in panel D here, and the amplified short wave reflection, which is gold curve in panel D here. The reduced uh, short wave reflection uh, is associated with Antarctic CS retreating as well as the SRB feedback. While the gold curve, which is the amplified short wave reflection, is associated with changes in cause. And uh, besides the short wave warming, we find that the sense of a heat, which is a green curve in panel B here, the sense of a heat generally follows the patterns in net surface heat flux here. And the sense of a heat is altered by the uh, air sea temperature contrast and the surface wind speed, the special pattern in panel C and E here, and the only average in panel F here. And also we find that the ozone changes lead to uh, Latent heat cooling are uh, the purple line in panel B here. And the latent heat cooling is probably due to the changes to the wind speed to the south of 48 degrees south here. And also we find that the CS can directly change the surface heat flux, which is the orange curve in panel B here. It leads to positive anomalies within about 50 to 60 degrees south, so while negative change to the south of 60 degrees south in the South Ocean. Yeah, with the results in the uh, surface heat fast and ocean circulations, here we want to link change, we want to link the ocean heat uptake and the ozone and the ocean circulation induced changes in maritime ocean heat transport convergence. So here we analyze the heat budget in which we define the ocean heat storage as the difference between ocean heat uptake and the maritime ocean heat transport convergence. And the results are shown in panel B here. So we find that the Blue curve here, which refers to ocean heat uptake, we find that the ocean, the southern ocean gets heat from the atmosphere with a range of about 49 to 61 degrees south. However, due to the effects of ocean circulations and the fueling process, uh, which may transport the heat to lower latitudes, which is the red curve here. So that's the ocean heat storage peaks at lower latitudes, about 44 degrees south here. Corresponding to the changes in the ocean heat storage, we find that the ozone induced southern ocean warming, which is the panel C here, the ozone induced southern ocean warming peaks around 45 degrees south. And comparing the ozone induced warming with the historical warming, the panel E here, notice that the color bar here are different. So we find that the ozone induced warming experiences about one fourth of the historic southern ocean warming. While other forces, the panel B here, other forces such as a well-mixed greenhouse gas may still be dominant for the historic simulation there. Yeah, with the changes in temperature, we further analyze the ocean heat content time scalars. We wanted to know to what extent can the ozone changes contribute to the ocean heat content anomaly in the Southern Ocean. And the panel here shows the basal integrated full depth ocean heat content anomaly since 1958. And the Red curve here refers to ozone induced anomaly, while the blue curve here refers to the historical anomaly. And we find that the ozone induced ocean heat content trend accounts for about 22% of the historic 
ocean head content and anomaly in the southern ocean. And uh, we further separated the flood depths into the upper ocean and the deeper ocean, which is the panda B here. We found that the ozone induced ocean head content anomaly is most stored in the upper 2000 meters there. Yeah, to better understand the ozone induced temperature change here, we further decompose the changes into spaceness and heat component. The spaceness component refers to the changes on density coordinate, which refers to uh, which is associated with changes in water mass properties. While the heat component is associated with vertical uh, movement of the SP knot. And here are the decomposition and the panel B here shows the spaceness component. So we find that due to ozone changes, the warming trend extends down equatorward and downward uh, from surface layer at 65 degrees south. And the warming uh, roughly occurs in the upper 500 meters uh, to the north of 60 degrees south. And the panel C here is the heat component. The heat component here is associated with the vertical movement of the SP knot, which is the red figure here. So we find that the vertical movement of the SP knot is most dominated by the surface wind stress curve anomaly. So in particular, the positive wind stress curve anomaly between 40 to about 52 degrees south, uh, it is, uh, deepens to the SP knot. Therefore, it contributes to the uh, equator world and the warming time there. And however, to the south of 62 degrees south, the negative SP knot, the negative wind stress curve anomaly, it shallows the SP knot. However, due to the Vertical temperature inversion in this region, the shallowing as peak north will lead to subsurface warming in this region. And here are some of the conclusions. Uh, first of all, we find that the ozone changes contribute to about half of the historical intensification of forward migration of the southern hemisphere westerly winds during 1958 to 2005. And the wind can also change the Ocean circulations lead to the power intensification of the Deakin seal as well as the residual mob in the southern ocean. And we also find that the ocean, the heat budget analysis suggests that the heat enters the ocean in the southern ocean most within 49 to 61 degrees south. However, due to the effects of ocean circulations and the diffusion process, the ocean heat storage peaks at a lower latitude around 44 degrees south. And we also find that ozone induced warming contributes to about 22% of the historic southern ocean warming during this period. And the spaceness and heat decomposition suggests that per world of 62 degrees south, where a vertical temperature inversion occurs, the shallowing as big as can lead to subsurface warming. And however, uh, to the north of 50 degrees south, the depression uh, warming that corresponds to the ocean heat storage maximum is primarily due to the Deepening as big knots. And we also find that the large scale patterns of as big movement are consistent well with the surface overlying a wind stress curve anomaly, which identifies the important role of wind changes in the southern ocean heat redistribution in response to ozone forcing. Yeah, and all the results at present, at present here have been published on climate dynamics. Yeah, thank you. Great, thanks. Do we have any questions? Yeah, we've got one from Gokhan. Yeah, just uh, at the last point, you indicated that the wind stress curl is playing a bigger role than wind stress itself. Why is that? Are you mean this one? Uh, well, in your last conclusion, yeah, the fourth one, it says the wind stress curl anomaly is, right? Yeah. So it's not the zonal wind stress itself, but it's the curl. Is that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, the wind the zonal wind stress can alter the ocean circulations. Well, the wind stress curve normally may lead to the such as Eggman pumping, so it will lead to as big no movement there. Okay. That's both important, I should see. All right, I think we'll move on to our last talk of this session. We're very close to staying on time here. So our last talk uh, will be from Ken Shearer. Uh, the title is Marine Wild Capture Fisheries After Nuclear War.
I guess I first have, have to unmute myself. Okay, now I'm gonna start sharing the screen. Um, all right, can you see that everyone? Uh, we can't, oh, it's coming. Now? Yep, there it is, perfect. Okay, great, uh, thanks. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Autonomous University of Barcelona and uh, here today I wanted to present something slightly different. I'm going to shift the topic to catastrophic and sudden climatic change and to fisheries. And I've squeezed a lot of things in here, but the point is to give you an example of what kind of questions that uh, CESM outputs uh, can be used to investigate. Um, Right, but first, why is it important to think about the consequences of nuclear war? Um, this figure from CIPRI shows the number of nuclear warheads by country in 2019. And even though there's been a large decrease in the number of weapons since the Cold War, there's definitely enough warheads uh, currently to cause huge destruction. So there's an, also an increasing number of countries that have these weapons. For example, notably India and Pakistan have rapidly growing weapons arsenals. And these two neighboring countries have been in armed conflict several times in the past decades. So the existence of these weapons uh, means that a large scale conflict is possible. Um, and beyond the direct destruction, a nuclear war could also uh, cr create a global climate disaster. Um, detonations of weapons in urban areas could cause huge fires and firestorms and the soot from these fires uh, could rise into the upper atmosphere. So similar as during large volcanic eruptions, these emissions could block out sunlight and cool the earth for several years. And this is where uh, CSM or other earth system models come, comes in. The figure here shows the simulated spread of soot from a US-Russia nuclear exchange simulated by Kupadel. Um, and this in turn could create a global food disaster. So this study by Jonas Jägermeier and colleagues published last year used simulations from CSM of a regional conflict between India and Pakistan to force global crop models. And uh, they estimated that a regional war could cause 11% um, global decline in calories from four of the major crops uh, globally sustained during five years. Um, but I'm a fisheries person, uh, so this is a quick overview of global fisheries production or global fish production. And uh, the figure from FAO shows the total fish and seafood production from 1950 until present. And as you can see, the major part has historically been uh, from marine capture fisheries, this orange chunk here. Although today marine and inland aquaculture combined is equally large, essentially. Um, but this orange chunk provides about 10% of the total animal protein production globally. And even though this is very small in terms of calories and also relative to other animal pro production, uh, fisheries could be a pretty important food source if land-based production systems begin to fail. So the aims of our study was to understand how climatic and socioeconomic changes caused by nuclear war could affect global fish catch and biomass and how these changes could impact global food security. Um, so I'm gonna start a little bit uh, by briefly explaining how we model global fisheries and Cheryl talked about this this morning. Um, but there are, for those of you who didn't hear, uh, there are several global fisheries models that use gridded either two or three dimensional environmental variables like MPP, SST, oxygen, Etc. to model the abundance of fish in the global ocean. Um, and this figures Cheryl also showed, um, but similar, uh, just like there's a sea MIP for climate models, there's a fish MIP for marine ecosystem and fisheries models. And this study by lots and colleagues made ensemble model projections for fisheries and the climate change with six global fisheries models. The first figure here shows the change the projected change in total global fish biomass under four RCPs. Um, and these lines here are averaged across six different marine ecosystem models. To the right, we have RCP 8.5, uh, where each model um, projection is, is outlined. And also uh, dashed and solid lines show the uh, different results on, from when forcing with GDF, GFDL or IPSL. 
So with Earth system outputs, we can try to calculate the effects on marine ecosystems and on fisheries production. And uh, I work with boats, one of the six models included in this fish mood study. Um, this is a quick overview of boats. Um, in the model, we simulate the relationships between the environment to the left, very simplistically uh, represented by net primary production and sea surface temperature. Um, the growth of size structured fish, structured fish populations here in the middle um, and the amount of fishing that humans uh, exert here to the right. Um, so the water temperature and the MPP sets the constraints on how much fish can grow, both in terms of providing food energy represented up here, but also uh, by constraining the maximal possible growth rate of ectotherms. Um, and in the model, we have uh, three different generic types of fish, small bodied, medium sized and large sized fish. And these fish uh, grow and they, when they reach, reach a certain size, they reproduce and they create new tiny fish. And, and finally, we have what we call the fishing effort, how much energy we spend on catching fish. Uh, and this in the model is determined by, first of all, how much fish there is available and by a number of socioeconomic parameters that are related to economics and management. And out we get these kinds of maps uh, of global fish catches uh, over time. Uh, so to the nuclear war simulations that we use in this study. Um, we use diff six different nuclear war scenarios developed by Tunadal and Kupadal. Uh, they're named after the pterograms of soot that they emit, essentially representing the magnitude of the war. There are five India-Pakistan scenarios uh, and one for a war between the US and Russia. And here to the right, I summarized uh, the effect that these soot emissions would have on the radiative forcing and the SST. And these are maximum annual global means post-war. And this five teragram scenario, the smallest one, is the one that was expected to cause the 11% decline in global crop production. And as a comparison here, I also put the RCP 8.5 uh, prediction by 2100. So um, my colleagues used uh, CSM to simulate the impacts of these war scenarios on the global climate. And we simply took the changes in uh, sea surface temperature and MPP uh, and used it as inputs to boats to estimate the impacts on fish and fisheries. Um, but a key question is whether people would fish the same after a nuclear war. It's a pretty serious disruption, socioeconomic disruption. So our approach here was to, again, set up a few very simple scenarios for the potential socioeconomic responses. First, a kind of control scenario where fishing goes about the same way as before, business as usual. Second, it's possible that lack of food on land would intensify the search for fish. So we have an intensified fishing scenario. And it's also uh, possible that the war would limit our ability to fish, maybe due to lack of food or food, fuel uh, or destroyed infrastructure. So we have a decreased fishing ability uh, scenario too. All right, I'm gonna give you some quick results. Um, this figure here shows uh, the total, the change in total global fish catch, total global biomass, and also in the fishing effort um, relative to a control, control scenario without war for the different, for the six different uh, nuclear war scenarios from five teragrams to 150 teragrams. And this row shows the business as usual scenario. So here we essentially, essentially only see the direct climatic effect. You can see in the middle that the decrease in biomass is up to about uh, minus 20% in the 150 teragram case which in turn leads to about a 30% decrease in the catch. But you can also see that in the five teragram case, the decrease is only a few percent. So relatively small, especially compared to crops. Um, and this row here shows what happens if we have intensified fishing uh, due to the war. And here you can see in the catch that we can get a temporary, but quite small increase in catch up to about 20% if the climate shock is not too large. Um, and then intensified fishing, of course, causes a rapid decrease in the remaining fish biomass, which is the reason why the increase can only be sustained for a few years. 
If we look at the spatial distribution uh, of these changes, we can see that high latitudes, um, so countries like Russia, Canada, the US and Japan are negatively affected, as well as equatorial regions, while especially in the lower impact scenarios, we have some regions that actually see increases in the, in the catch. Um, and finally, yes, and finally, like many of you may be aware, uh, fisheries worldwide are sometimes in the poor overfish state where the biomass has been depleted while other fisheries are well managed with healthy abundant fish stocks. So in the paper we also investigated the difference in the amount of emergency fish catches that we could potentially get if all fisheries were poorly managed to the left or versus if they're well managed before the war here to the right. And we estimated that if all fisheries were well managed catches from intensified fishing could become large enough in the first year after the war to replace almost 40% of all other animal production. So this could buy some time to adapt uh, food production systems on land. So in conclusion, um, the climatic shock uh, causes up to a 30% and 20% decrease in catch and biomass respectively. Uh, this, these numbers are comparable with the projected end of century decline under RCP 8.5. Um, and it is the light reduction that is the key driver of change. Light reduction causes the decrease generally in the MPP, which uh, translates into a decrease in the catch. Um, but the outcome depends a lot on the fishery responses and also on the pre-war fishery status. Uh, we find smaller impacts on fish than on crops, but we have to remember that the contribution of fisheries to global calorie intake is very small. However, when it comes to animal protein, fisheries can probably make a contribution and we find that re well regulated fisheries could briefly replace about 40% of all other protein. Uh, so that's it for me. I don't know if there's time for questions. Yeah, any questions for Kim? Yeah, Isla. That was really interesting. I was wondering if you have considered applying the same methods to geoengineering if the light reduction is Right, uh, so uh, I'm going to most likely start a postdoc with Cheryl Harrison uh, in, by Christmas, more or less, and then we are definitely going to look at the effects of geoengineering, uh, and I'm hopefully going to start a little bit doing it. Um, but yeah, it would be very interesting to see what the differences are and the similarities. Yeah, thanks. See ya. Uh, Ashu? Yeah, I have a question. Is uh, right now, first you just assume the fish they will not change, but by the nuclear radiation, they may modify the fish, and then they, they may grow differently. So, what if you take that into consideration, whether will that change, and uh, what the result is going to be? I'm afraid I can't hear you very well. Oh, I didn't quite catch that. Okay, my question is. Uh, the nuclear radiation may change the fish, the gene of the fish. So the fish may grow differently. They may grow like a bigger or a smaller, and uh, but that will affect the result. So uh, we haven't looked specifically at the direct effects of radiation fallout on fish. That's the that's the question, right? Yes. Um, but we have looked at other studies. So there are examples of both studies that have been made when during nuclear uh, weapons testings, but also studies looking at the effects uh, of, um, for example, the Fukushima uh, disaster on neighboring fish. And to my understanding, um, I don't, I, I haven't seen anyone kind of showing uh, evidence for changes in the genetics of the fish. The, the discussion there is more about the potential for humans to eat the fish, if it would be harmful for us, if you get uh, large amounts of radiation uh, by eating it. And it seems like these effects are quite localized, uh, mainly because of the dilution that happens in seawater compared to on land. So uh, animals on land, uh, are, are gonna be more uh, exposed to fallout than fish in general in the ocean. 
<laughs> All right, we'll take one last question from Thomas um, and then we'll have about a five minute break. Hi, thank you, Kim, very much for the interesting talk. Um, I was wondering that uh, the suit emissions from the direct consequences of, uh, of uh, bombardment uh, would probably occur, and, and your maps seem to confirm that, in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but when you show, and, and you say that the main driver of the fisheries impact is in fact sunlight. So why isn't that hemispheric asymmetry reflected in the maps of uh, catch um, changes? So I'm, I'm not an expert here, but from what I understand, and uh, we can at least look at the maps, from what I understand, um, so, so, so this depends on the scenario for the US Russia, of course, we're going to have most of the emissions in the northern hemisphere for India, Pakistan, it's going to be more centralized around the equator or very localized in that area. And I, from what I understand, um, the simula simulations suggest that soot is going to rise high enough for the, for the soot to spread into the atmosphere and cover almost the entire globe. So in the, at least a couple of years after, there's going to be effects not only close to the actual uh, conflict areas, but around the earth. So I think that's why we don't see any clear regional effects from that. I don't know if Cheryl can, is she there? Maybe she has something to add yeah. about this? Yeah, I'm here. Alan is here. Alan is here. Alan, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. The, the smoke gets heated, goes up in the stratosphere and spreads around the world. It lasts for years. And we've seen forest fires recently that demonstrate that from Australia. The smoke got heated and went up 20 kilometers in the stratosphere. So that's a much less smoke than we were modeling. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so we'll take a very short break. Um, Isla, is there anything you wanna add um, logistically? Um, no, I think we'll just start again at three, uh, just to keep on time. So, sorry, it's a short break. So, Sarah, do you know how to, if, if you're a host, where you see the polls? Yeah, usually it's just at the bottom. There's like the participants chat, et cetera. And one of them yeah. usually pull. Hmm. Um, so it, but I think it has to be, when the meeting is set up, it has to be set up as an option to uh, add polls. Okay. And it's possible that it wasn't set up that way. Okay. I, I have a poll on mine. Oh, you do? Okay. Did I make you? The host, so you can see? Uh, yeah, sure. So on mine, it's between the participants and the chat. It says polls. So hold on. Uh, I'll have to um, switch it back unless you want to be the one that stops all the live stream and recording, which you're very capable of. <laughs> Now, um, oh, the whole feature went away on mine. Mm. And maybe you should make me co host. I don't, I don't have it. Maybe it's just because you made the meeting. Mm. Huh. Well, what if we want to do a poll, I guess. I guess, do you have it back now? Or uh, let me make Yeah, I those. still can see it. It went away for a second, but now I can see it again. You hover over the bottom of the screen. All right, we're just gonna go to the restroom before we start again. We can, okay. Uh, we can figure it out. Okay.
All right, hello, it's uh, three o'clock. Sorry, that was a short break. Um, we'll get started with the, the final session of our uh, working group meeting before we have a discussion. And so this session is about extremes and severe weather and hydroclimate. So we'll start with Alyssa Stansfield. And, and just a reminder for the speakers, I'll give you a two minute warning, warning at eight minutes and then we'll stop at 10 minutes. Okay, great, thank you. Can you see my slides? Um, yes. Okay, yeah. great. Um, so thank you. My name is Alyssa Stansfield. I'm a PhD candidate at Stony Brook University. And this is work I've been doing alongside my advisor, um, Kevin Reed. And so um, we are trying to use simplified CAM simulations to try to understand the response of tropical cyclone rainfall to climate change. And so it probably comes as a surprise to no one here that predicting changes in tropical cyclone rainfall is difficult. Um, there's a lot of things that go into predicting the amount of precipitation from TCs at a given location, such as the number of landfalls, the translation speeds of the storms, uh, their sizes, intensities, and the precipitation rates. And all of these factors um, also interplay amongst each other to you know, produce the amount of rainfall from tropical cyclones. And this is important because rainfall from tropical cyclones can be not only deadly, but also very economically destructive. And so what do we know about um, how TC rainfall is impacted by climate change? So the theory um, kind of behind this pr the predictions is the clausius clapeyron rate, um, which so basically the thought is that since water, the amount of water vapor the air can hold increases by a, about 7% per degree of warming um, that the rainfall from extreme events like tropical cyclones will follow that rate. Um, and so um, the consensus from different modeling studies is certainly that yes, TC rainfall should increase in the future, but by exactly how much um, and if that's going to follow the clausius clapeyron rate is kind of uncertain. It depends on which study you look at. Um, kind of how you look at the precipitation, whether you're using spatial averages, um, whether you're looking at a given location like the, North, the East United States. Um, so we kind of want to try to uh, hammer down kind of um, this uncertainty. And so to do this, we want to use simplified uh, CAM models. Um, so again, I'm using the Community Atmosphere Model version 5 um, with the official RCE MIP comp set that um, has come out with CASM2. And I'm using the protocols of RCE MIP, which, is de which are detailed in Wing et al 2018, except I'm adding rotation. Um, and so the idea is that, you know, we start with the real earth, we can re represent the real earth using like a MIP style, more realistic simulations. Um, then we can simplify further to the RCE MIP simulations, which are aqua planets, um, they have uniform SST everywhere. Uh, the solar insulation is uniform all over the globe. Um, and the aerosols are constant. And so again, then we get to my simulation, um, which is like RCE MIP, except it, the Earth rotates. And we are running the CAM at about 28 kilometer resolution. So I run 11 simulations with uh, globally uniform SST varying from 295 to 305 Kelvin. Um, again, I'm using 28 kilometer grid spacing and the SE dynamical core. And so quickly, what do these simulations look like? Um, so you'll see on the left an animation of um, wind speed and the 300 Kelvin simulation. And so all of these uh, little dots here are tropical cyclones tracked using the Tempest Extreme software. And so what we, what we see is that TCs in these TC worlds tend to form in the tropics and subtropics. Um, move poleward with beta drift and then kind of accumulate up near the poles. And so we're not the first to use these type of simulations. Shavas and Reed 2019 did a kind of more um, dynamical look at these simulations. Um, but what I'll just note here is that for the precipitation analysis that I'm going to show you, we limit it to uh, 40 degrees south to 40 degrees north because we, don't, we kind of want to avoid the complications um, of the TCs that are near the poles and the interactions between them. We don't want to deal with that. 
Um, so here's just some TC precipitation composites. So the the each box is a different simulation with a different SST that's up on the top uh, left. And then the number of like snapshots that go into these composites, it's on the bottom. And so what we see here is that definitely in the inner core, the TC precipitation increases. And then also it seems that as the SST increases, the precipitation field seems to expand a little bit as well. And so if I do a simple estimate of um, the percentage precipitation change per Kelvin change in SST, we get about 7.37% uh, per Kelvin change, which is probably slightly above clausius clapeyron although there's a kind of a large range of uncertainty um, in the way that we calculated that. Um, but so next we want to ask how much do the thermodynamic versus the dynamic factors increase um, affect the increasing TC precipitation. So we kind of uh, created this equation that estimates the change in TC precipitation is equal to change in the moisture availability, which is the thermodynamic factor, plus the change in TC intensity, plus the change in TC size, which we consider the changes in intensity and size, the dynamic changes. And so we kind of uh, divide this up into like these partial derivatives. Um, I won't go too far into this equation because um, I don't have time, but basically we estimate the total change in precipitation um, per SSC change on the left using the uh, changes in the means of the precipitation distributions within the TCs. Um, the DP changes in uh, based just on the changes in SST change in intensity and change in size are estimated using a Poisson regression. And then the changes in intensity and size uh, per change in SST are estimated with linear regressions of the changes in mean intensity and size. And so uh, these are the kind of uh, rudimentary results of this analysis. So um, we look at two different uh, precipitation variables, the 99th percentile and the accumulated TC precipitation. And so the colors correspond to the different uh, kind of contributions. Well, first of all, the, the total change um, in precipitation per Kelvin is 8.58 for the 99th percentile precipitation and 6.62 for the accumulated. So they're around clausius clapeyron although the 99th percentile is certainly a little bit above. And what we found was that um, the SC, so the thermodynamic contribution kind of dominated the precipitation increases um, for both accumulated and 99th percentile. Um, the intensity, however, contributed a bit more for the 99th percentile, whereas the size uh, contributed more for the accumulated, which um, makes sense um, since as a storm gets larger, there probably should be more precipitation. Um, so just some quick uh, results and these top ones I did not show in this presentation, but I just thought I'd mention them. Um, in these simulations, as the SST warms, there's less TCs at any one time. The average TC is more intense and larger and there's more extreme precipitation rates within the TCs and more rainfall is coming from these extreme precipitation rates. Um, and then when we dove a little bit further into the TC precipitation analysis, we found that um, the exact results kind of depend on the precipitation metric that you use. Uh, the precipitation changes were around the clausius clapeyron rate, um, slightly above for the 99th percentile and the thermodynamic contributions dominated um, over the dynamic contributions to the change. And while the in intensity contributed more to the 99th percentile change, the outer size uh, changes contributed more to the accumulated precipitation changes. And so now my current work, um, which I'll just briefly mention, is I want to link the idealized modeling uh, back to the real world. So I want to take the this rotating RCE MIP idealized simulations, see how they compare to AMIP simulations, um, as well as observations. And so I won't go too much in detail into these plots, but these are joint dependence plots of um, 99th percentile precip TC precipitation, uh, their dependence on SST, which is the Y axis here, and intent TC intensity, which is the X axis. And so uh, these 
plots, well, the two on the left are fairly new, so I'm still kind of working on this analysis, but so far it seems that the uh, kind of pattern of these precipitation changes are consistent uh, between the idealized simulation and the AMIP simulations and these observations, which I got from the Emerge satellite, but I'll probably be using other observations as well. Um, so I'll just mention that this most of this work is under review at JGR Atmospheres. Um, and if you have any questions or want um, more information, if I have time for questions, I can take them. And if not, uh, my email is up on the slide. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any questions for Alyssa? I guess I'm wondering whether you, you see any scope for any kind of other experiments in between the AMIP and your ones, like if you had meridional gradient in SST or something, do you think that would be helpful? Yeah, that could definitely uh, be kind of an intermediary. Another uh, kind of more intermediary thing I'm thinking of using are, is a reanalysis. So I think I'm going to use the ERA-5 reanalysis to do, because um, that's, you know, between maybe observations and AMIP simulations. I'm not sure if I'll be able to get any more um, idealized simulations, as you mentioned, in, um, just because I'm probably finishing my PhD uh, next spring, but um, that would definitely be in interesting to do. Okay, uh, there's a question in the chat. Um, what, what is it about the simplified model that makes rainfall fields look more symmetrical than they are in observations and fully coupled simulations? That's a very good question. Um, my first guess is that there is just uh, way more observations. So I don't know if you are way more like uh, snapshots that go into the composites that may be making them more symmetrical. Um, additionally, the other thing is that there's really not a lot of wind shear in these simulations. So, um, you know, there's not any like extra tropical transitioning storms to kind of make a more asymmetrical shape of the storms. Um, so that's my my two thoughts. That's an interesting question though. Okay, thanks. We'll move on to the next speaker. If you have more questions for Alyssa, just type them in the chat. Um, so our next speaker is Megan Frank talking about impacts of large scale natural variability on severe weather over the United States. Hey everybody, let me get this presentation pulled up here and we'll go ahead and get rolling. All right, so I am assuming you can see my screen. Yep. Um, so yeah. hello, welcome. My name is Megan Frankie and I am a master's student in the Department of Atmospheric Science at Colorado State University. I'd first like to take a second to thank the organizers of this workshop and the Climate Variability and Change Working Group for setting this up and giving me the opportunity to participate. Today, I will be sharing with you some of our work on the impacts of climate variability on large scale severe weather environments over the United States. I would also like to acknowledge my collaborator, collaborators listed at the bottom of this slide. In the United States, spring marks the onset of the severe storm season, which annually accounts for billions of dollars in damage. Therefore, understanding the future projected changes in convective environments could largely help to enhance resilience to severe weather outbreaks. The overarching questions driving our research are listed below, but a major focus of our work is to understand how both forced and natural variations in climate relate to the occurrence of severe weather over the continental US by using the CESM2 large ensemble to analyze the historical and projected future evolution of climate. To date, the existing literature on this topic includes a limited number of studies that have used tools such as convection permitting regional climate simulations under pseudo global warming scenarios to examine how the forced component of climate change may impact the severe weather environments over the United States by the end of the century. For instance, this figure is from a recent paper by Kristen Rasmussen and colleagues. It shows the end of century average mixed layer convective available potential energy in the left column and convective inhibition in the, on the right for the months May through June. They forced WARF with ERA-5 data to produce a control run shown in the top row and a pseudo-global warming run in the middle row using multi-model mean changes in climate from RCP 8.5 CMIP-5 simulations. The difference between the two thus can be viewed as the force signal associated with climate change. Briefly, what you notice are large increases in both the end of century convective available potential energy and convective inhibi inhibition over the eastern half of the US with the largest changes over the southern and southeastern regions. 
Increases in both of these parameters are conducive to producing more intense severe thunderstorms. Now, instead of using a time slice approach, as was previously seen, we are using the CESM2 large ensemble to compute severe storm parameters directly and, ex and examine how they have changed over time. For instance, shown, in, shown is the CESM2 ensemble mean of CAPE from 1850 to 2100 in the dark blue line, which illustrates the forced response. And the variability of individual ensemble members are shown in the background in light blue. Utilizing a large ensemble approach from the CESM2 allow, also gives us the capability to evaluate contributions from both forced and internal variability. To our knowledge, the full-time evolution of these parameters and the role of the forced versus natural variability had not been rigorously examined to date. More specifically, but briefly, what we have done is process daily data from a 14-member CESM2 ensemble of the historical period from 1850 to 2014 and an eight-member ensemble of future climate from 2015 to 2100. We then computed the following severe weather parameters from daily data. First is the conductive available potential energy, or CAPE, which is a good indicator of how buoyant an air parcel is. Next, the lower tropospheric bulk vertical wind shear, or SO6, which is the difference between winds at the surface and six kilometers above ground level, and is useful in determining storm type and organization. And lastly, the product of CAPE and SO6, CAPE SO6, which is, pro which is proven to be a useful proxy for capturing both the kinematic and thermodynamic components of a thunderstorm. Previous studies have shown CAPE SO6 to be useful in discriminating between severe and non-severe storms. Our focus is on the March through June seasonal averages as it is the peak severe weather season for the United States. To validate our model, we are using various reanalysis products, but here I will only show results from ERA5. This image shows uh, the 30 year historical period for March through June Cape SO6 ensemble average for all 14, mem for all 14 members from CESM. Recalling the force signal of CAPE adapted from Rasmussen and colleagues, we can see similarities in the patterns of end of century CAPE and historical CAPE SO6 trends, especially over the Southeast US. Although when you consider a March through June CAPE SO6 trends from ERA5 for the same period, seen here on the right, there is a significant difference in the patterns and magnitudes. Now, trends from reanalysis projects products are problematic to begin with, but it is important to note that if we consider a single ensemble member from the CESM, as seen here, rather than the ensemble mean, we see a different story. Now, not only are the magnitudes of CAPE SO6 of similar values, but the patterns are consistent as well. To further illustrate the run-to-run -run differences due to natural climate variability, here I show the CAPE SO6 trends of all 14 individual members over the historical 30-year period, as well as the ERA5 trend for the lower right. Again, as each ensemble member is a single realization of how uh, nature might have evolved, the ERA-5 falls within a range of plausible outcomes uh, over this period simulated by the CESM, therefore giving us confidence in using this model as a tool to look at future projected changes in convective environments, as I will show next. Shown here is the evolution of Cape SO6 over the next 30 years from 2020 to 2049. Because of time, I will hereafter only focus on Cape SO6, although we are analyzing other parameters as well. As a reminder, the red colors here indicate increase while blue indicates a decrease. This figure shows all eight future ensemble members from the CESM, as well as the ensemble mean all forced with SSP5 8.5 forcing. In the bottom right, we can see the ensemble mean trend or the forced greenhouse gas response, which shows increases in Cape SO6 almost everywhere over the continental US, but particularly in the Southeast and over the Gulf of Mexico. What is most interesting is that although the ensemble mean shows increases in Cape SO6 similar to historical simulations, there appears to be large deviations between each member. For example, to highlight contrasting runs, ensemble member three shows negative trends for Cape SO6 over the Southeast US, which strongly contrasts with ensemble member eight, which instead shows a strong positive trend in this region. Taking this a step further, we can use ensemble members three and eight from the previous slides, both with very different trends and decompose them into the forced and unforced signals to try to better understand and highlight the differences that may be expected due to the natural and internal climate or internal climate variability alone. Focusing on the right column or the component of the trend due to natural climate variability, we can see that the natural variability can either act to suppress the increases of Cape SO6 due to anthropogenic climate change, which is the case for ensemble member three here on the top, 
or act to add to the increases of Cape SO6 due to climate change as seen with ensemble number eight on the bottom. The most important point overall is that the unforced variability spatial structure is large and coherent and is of the same magnitude of the forced response over the next 30 years, showing that the unforced variability is just as important to consider. Another aspect of my graduate work is to focus on the specific regions to quantify the role of internal variability and to further understand how natural variability in these convective parameters might be tied to regional changes in sea surface temperatures. Although I am evaluating various regions, such as changes in convective environments over the Great Plains or the South Central US, today I am only sharing results over the Southeast US to illustrate the relationship between Cape SO6 and SSTs for that region alone. Moreover, as I pointed out in my previous slides, this area is one of the largest variabilities in future Cape SO6 simulations. Before we dive into any of the SST relationships, this time series depicts the March through June ensemble mean of Cape SO6 trends in white, as well as the individual members three and eight, which show different trends through 2049 over this region. Specifically, while it is clear that although the large year-to-year -year variability is present in both ensemble members, ensemble member three, which is shown in blue, is projected to have an overall negative trend and thus a decrease in Cape SO6 over the next 30 years, while ensemble member eight in yellow is projected to have a positive trend and thus increase in Cape SO6. The correlation between Cape SO6 over the Southeast US and local sea surface temperatures shown here indicates that there does appear to be a relationship with year to year and longer term changes in SSTs, especially over the Gulf of Mexico. Although the maximum correlation values in the Gulf are of roughly 0.6, the spatial pattern is still very coherent. To further evaluate the relationship between SST and Southeast US Cape SO6, we computed a composite analysis of those for those years in which the absolute magnitude of Cape SO6 exceeded one standard deviation. The results confirm that the years when the model simulates an increase in Cape SO6 correspond to years of above average sea surface temperatures over the Gulf of Mexico. On the other hand, when the model simulated decreases in Cape, uh, decreases in Cape SO6, there were below average sea surface temperatures in the Gulf. To conclude, we have shown that Cape SO6 is projected to increase over the United States in both magnitude and extent through the century due to forced climate change, with the greatest increase expected over the Southeast US. However, over the next several decades, changes due to natural climate variability are equally notable. We also indicated that positive relationships exist between sea surface temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico and Southeast Cape, in Southeast US uh, Cape SO6. Overall, improved understanding of the causes of variability in severe weather, both natural and anthropogenic, may improve future predictions as well as enhance resilience to severe weather outbreaks. Uh, now I know that I'm approaching my time limit, so with that I will go ahead and conclude my presentation and take the remaining few minutes for any questions or comments that you might have. Thank you again for your time and attention. Thanks. Maria. Hello. Um, great talk. Um, Thanks. Uh, yeah, really interesting topic. Um, I was curious, I know you mentioned you didn't have a lot of time, um, and so you, you omitted some analyses, but when you shared a lot of results for CAPE, the product of CAPE and zero to six bulk layer shear, I think it was. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was wondering about, did you see any differing trends between those two different parameters? Because there's always that debate about um, if we know that CAPE is increasing, that's a pretty robust signal, but then the question that follows is that, that there's less confidence in the shear and that's so relevant for severe thunderstorms. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my first question I have too, but yeah. So I was wondering if you saw differing trends in CAPE versus shear. Yeah, we did. Um, as I showed in the beginning of the pre presentation, uh, the CAPE, we definitely saw a positive trend over the Southeast US Gulf of Mexico region, as I expressed. Um, and then as far as SO6 goes, the trend was a little bit different. It was uh, definitely a little bit more uh, horizontal, I guess. There appeared to be uh, increases all the way across the continental US and then a little bit more of a decrease below over the Gulf of Mexico, Texas region and across those latitudes. But we are looking at both of those individually. And overall, um, when you look at the product of CAPE SO6, it does appear that CAPE is the main uh, parameter driving the changes between the product of CAPE SO6. 
That makes sense. And then just a question slash maybe suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering about the motivation for uh, the analysis over water for severe thunderstorms. Um, I think you showed some of those correlations um, and also the environmental results. Um, and I guess my suggestion would be maybe to limit it to land um, just because as those environments are affected over land, they'll be modified and they're blowing out your color bar, your color range. So we can't see the land, but yeah, just question about motivation. Right, um, I mean, I think we, I don't think we were really trying to, uh, maybe I misspoke, but we weren't really analyzing any of the severe storms over the water. We were mostly just using the sea surface temperatures to correlate them with um, the storms over the uh, southeast U.S. So any of the, the water that was included in that analysis in that southeast U.S. region was masked. So I didn't actually include it in the correlations of uh, SSTs and Cape SS6. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, thank you. Sorry okay. for taking over. Oh, that's all right. Um, you have another question in the chat, so maybe you can just answer answer that there, and we'll move on to the next um, yeah. speaker. So the next speaker is Christine Shields, telling us about atmospheric rivers in Antarctica. Okay, so let me share my screen. To start full presentation mode. So is everyone seeing everything okay? It's not full screen at this point. Oh, really? You see your whole screen. Oh, now it is. Okay, good. I guess it's just a second. Okay, so yeah. uh, now for something totally different, I'm going to transport everyone into the cool high latitudes for those of us who are suffering in heat right now. <laughs> so uh, well, I'm going to talk about Antarctica and atmospheric rivers and a little bit about flavor, the fl different flavors of modes of variability. This presentation is in uh, collaboration with a number of people, Michelle McLennan at University of Colorado, Jonathan Weil, University of Grenoble, and Irina Gordetskaya at University of Aviro. Okay, so just, just a quick outline. Uh, first, I'm going to try to motivate you and tell you why Antarctic atmospheric rivers are so interesting. Uh, show you a little bit about the climatology of the region and we'll spend a little bit of time on uh, atmospheric river detection tools because this actually is quite important, especially for uh, regional areas such as Antarctica, that the definition of, an, of, a, of how we define an atmospheric river matters. And then uh, finally, just sort of launch into uh, some of the results I've seen with different modes of variability and what's important for different regions of Antarctica. All right, so this is a, a nice little movie that Michelle put together. It shows atmospheric rivers uh, making landfall over Antarctica. I've highlighted Kuwait's glacier over here uh, because I'm going to sort of transport you over here while that movie is going to um, this figure that shows snow accumulation totals over Kuwait's glacier um, uh, for the mean period of the ERA-5, uh, which was 1979 to 2018. And then uh, what happened in 2020 last year, we had three major atmospheric rivers uh, making landfall over the weights, one in February, one in May, one in July. And these were massive events that you could see compared to the, the mean really did uh, increase, boost the snow accumulation totals at those regions. So, so ho hopefully this will help to convince you that atmospheric rivers uh, over Antarctica actually are uh, quite important. Oops trying to advance here. Okay, there we go. All right, so a little bit about the climatology. Um, here is uh, some heat maps I call where we're looking at like the, the density of the ARs uh, as they've been detected, divided by uh, season, fall, winter, spring, and summer. Uh, if you notice the, um, the uh, color bar and the actual range, the atmospheric rivers that make landfall over Antarctica are actually of relatively rare events. We have on average three days of atmospheric river activity over Antarctica, so they're relatively rare events, but when they do occur, they're actually quite impactful. And the other thing to sort of take away from this plot is that for the different seasons, fall, winter, spring, and summer, you see different hot spots. So those deeper purple colors are um, shipped depending on what the season is. And this is actually quite important when we start looking at modes of variability. 
All right, so on to a little bit about um, what this geographical distribution looks like. Here I'm actually plotting a whole bunch of different ARDTs. These are atmospheric river detection tools from the atmospheric river tracking method intercomparison project. Uh, so there we have quite a few different ones to look at. All these colors mostly are, are ones that are global and are general uh, uh, detection algorithms. And I have uh, these darker purple ones, the while uh, IWB and while VIBT. These are regional specific and specific to Antarctica. And so just by looking at this, as you can see, there's actually quite a dramatic difference between uh, what a regional algorithm will tell you, what a global algorithm will tell you. And just to, for your perspective, here's Antarctica over here with this is zero, and we're actually looking at 180, around the horn, 180. The only place where there's agreement across all the algorithms is actually the minimum, um, which is this frosty area. So uh, sort of the, making this a little bit more um, digestible and uh, understandable, I've, I've actually grouped all the global ARDTs compared to regional ARDTs. And now we're looking at specific regions around Antarctica in terms of the seasonal cycle. Um, here is, a, again, my little cheat sheet map of Antarctica. <laughs> Instead of using the Antarctica, um, the Antarctic, uh, you know, land, uh, you know, um, names and stuff, I've actually used the, the ocean that it backs into as a reference. Um, just for just to, just because for me this is understandable. So apologies to all those Antarctic um, ice sheet people. <laughs> so EA would just be the East Antarctica that backs into the Atlantic. AI would be Atlantic India, and so forth and so forth, uh, so on and so forth. Um, WAP is just essentially I'm looking at this West Antarctic Peninsula area, and WAA is this backing into this Edmonton Sea area. So I've done these for all these different regions, but I'm only sort of highlighting a few here, uh, the West Antarctic Peninsula and the Amundsen Sea area versus a couple of the East Antarctic ones. And the thing to, the couple of things to pull out of this is that you can see, especially for the WP and the EA, it, you know, it's act absolutely opposite what the global zoo versus what the regionals do. Um, and the regional ones are a little bit more closer in line to um, what we might do if we were going to hand detect atmospheric rivers over um, Antarctica. Um, so, so I personally view these the regional ones as a little bit more accurate than the global ones, and I can sort of explain that and what what the global ones are doing and sort of picking up, you know, basically the Southern Ocean um, storm track as opposed to atmospheric rivers that are actually extending into um, the continent. Um, and then the other thing to sort of pull away, these globals tend to actually over, over detect um, ARs in the summer for the reasons I, I just mentioned. All right, so um, now I sort of wanted to spend the rest of my time sort of talking about modes of variability. And just for the record, I guess I should say I'm, I'm focused on these regional ARDTs. So I'm using the IWB and the VIBT from the wild Antarctic specific um, because I feel like the, that ARDT is superior for this type of analysis. So, uh, so now onto the modes of variability. Um, clearly the, the big one is the SAM. I don't really have to, I think, explain it to this group here. So this is just sort of a nice little graphic I pulled, pulled off to show what the, what the SAM is, um, which is essentially the first UF of sea level, of sea level pressure. Here's the spatial pattern. Um, I'm actually going to also look at um, the different EOFs of sea level pressure um, extending into EOF 1, 2, and 3. It turns out that EOF um, 3 actually has some significance for this um, uh, WAA area, where especially with Waits Glacier. So I sort of also want to include that in what I show you next. Um, I'm also will give you the caveat because of this, the time limitation, sorry, I'm trying to keep track of my time here, um, that I'm going to only just show you some results on West Antarctica. I do have them for East Antarctica, but, and so I'm happy to talk to people about that later, but for now, I'll just sort of show you just some highlights from the West Antarctic piece. So this is looking at the SAM and the PSA2 phases uh, for positive phase and negative phase. Um, and we're looking at the sea level pressure, which is the color contour. And then the vector um, arrows are the, is the moisture, the low level moisture flux. So this is, in, this is UV in, incorporated into uh, precipitable water. Um, and you can see for, both, for the positive phases for both SAM and PSA2, you see this flux of moisture 
into um, this West Antarctic piece. So this is favorable for atmospheric river activity. And for the negative phases, you see this outflow from the continent out into the oceans, which is not supportive uh, of atmospheric river activity. So this is sort of just like to give you some background. Um, uh, two minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, and so, um, so I guess we'll just jump to sort of the, 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 these different modes of variability regressed onto, um, I did both a number of variables, but we'll just sort of highlight here the, the precipitation because, and this is precipitation attributable to AR. So now I'm only looking at AR days where it precipitates. So you can see there is, for the SAM positive phase, you have this, you know, lower pressures, um, and it's positively correlated with precipitation in the Swiss Antarctica piece and negatively correlated uh, closer to the Ross, the Ross Sea area. For PSA2, you have these positive precipitation correlations uh, in this WAA section of uh, West Antarctica, which is where Thwaites Glacier uh, resides. So this, these are, um, and, there, and the dotted uh, is stippling um, that uh, implies significance for these regressions. All right, so the last little bit here, I sort of started looking at the PDO, uh, which is the first UF of SST anomalies. Uh, but instead of the typical thing of looking at uh, over the Western US, I'm actually gonna draw your attention here to West Antarctica um, because there is some correlations with West Antarctica. Uh, so for, um, this is the spatial pattern for, P for the PDO positive. Uh, sorry, the, I, you know, I, this was sort of a quick plot. Um, so we have uh, negative SST anomalies here for the PDO positive, which correlates to um, um, negative correlations with precipitation um, um, over the West Antarctic piece here. So if you flip that, so PDA, PDO negative phase would actually be supportive of AR activity in the West Antarctica Peninsula and over the West Antarctic ice sheet. And there is literature out there that has just come out that actually supports this. Okay, so just quick in summary, um, hopefully I've convinced you that atmospheric, uh, Antarctic atmospheric rivers are interesting. I certainly think they are. Um, I've showed you a little bit about the climatology and hopefully convinced you um, that the regional ARDT that I'm using is the most appropriate. Um, and then we've looked at different modes of variability thus far, SAM, PSA2, and the PDO and their influences over Antarctica. Um, as I've, I've done a lot of subsetting and I'm continuing on this work, done stuff with East Antarctica. Uh, I plan to um, move forward in this looking at model resolution of the variable resolution CSM that Adam Harrington talked about a little bit earlier. And I think a number of other people may have been in the land ice working group, uh, that high resolution piece over Antarctica um, and other high resolution simulations. Um, so I'll stop there and take questions. Thanks. So there's one question in the chat from Alice. She's wondering um, how the magnitude of the atmospheric rivers versus frequency differ by season. It looked like more purple colors in winter, but do the, is the total snowfall lower in these months? And have you looked at that? Yeah, so this is entirely sort of dependent on what region you're looking at. It's not like a one slice fits all sort of a thing. Um, so Alice, we can sit down and look at different maps and I can show you, you know, which pieces are better. There's there's some, you know, for for the most part, um, like, uh, you know, for if it's well, I could I shouldn't say for the most part, but there is evidence that there's, you know, both atmospheric rivers can contribute to the, these, you know, increase of snow totals like we saw in the Waits Glacier in that beginning, but also um, in East Antarctica piece, um, there's evidence that for you know, Sam negative, you have um, where it's warmer and not necessarily conducive to air activity, you get these warm air intrusion events would actually cause, and then you, you get you know something that may result, look like an atmospheric river that would cause a melting event um, because it's warm air uh, that's doing this uh, rain on snow sort of, or uh, yeah, rain on snow sort of thing. So um, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure if that answered your question. I hope, I hope so. Okay, I think we probably best move on. Flavio, maybe you can type your question in the chat after you've given your talk. Sure, yep. Um, okay, so next speaker is Flavio talking about the extreme 2020 Siberia temperatures. All right, so yeah, thanks um, for uh, organizing this nice session, uh, Isla, Sarah, and Aishu. I uh, hope you can see the screen. 
Yeah, so this is a, it's a bit work in progress um, with like a sort of an illustrious team uh, of people that started with a Twitter discussion last summer um, when there was this heat wave uh, or sort of persistent temperature anomaly over Siberia that um, was in the news a little bit. And um, I'll talk about a few more nuanced aspects uh, um, in, in this presentation. The relevance in general was, uh, it was quite interesting in, in the context that it was just a very strong temperature anomaly, but it's also uh, coincided not just last year, but last year in particular with uh, widespread fires over Siberia, as well as sort of uh, worry about accelerated permafrost melt during these really persistent temperature anomalies. And so we're gonna try to look at uh, this a little bit um, in more detail. Um, a couple of attribution studies have come out quick, quite quickly, especially focused on the first half of 2020, which was sort of the one that grabbed the headlines. I was one, involved with one with this um, uh, World Weather Attribution team where uh, we looked on the one hand at sort of the half year, so January through uh, June temperature anomaly over Siberia. You see the map of this plotted here. Uh, but then uh, the study also looked at the, the daily maximum temperature at a particular station, which went over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which was the first time in the Arctic Circle. So that really grabbed the headlines, but was maybe less interesting, at least from a scientific point of view. Um, yeah, here's a, the daily temperature time series. It was just very extreme, but it was an extreme event in general also, if you look at sort of the half year average. Uh, and the attribution study, maybe unsurprisingly, um, then concluded that at least this first half year was effectively almost impossible without human influence. This derives from sort of this, um, uh, yeah, sort of expansive analysis of, of observations and, and different models, large ensembles, to come up with a probability that this event could occur in today's climate, comparing it to a uh, pre industrial climate. And so the probability that this could occur was uh, without uh, climate change was extremely low uh, that led to this headline of almost impossible. Um, people also looked at sort of the, the drivers and again, in particular of the winter and the spring part of this event, um, a study by Overling and Wang uh, pointed out that, yeah, the Arctic oscillation was very uh, positive during the winter 2019, 2020. Uh, which was like driven by a strong, um, very strong polar vortex, uh, like I think even record breaking ozone uh, levels in the Arctic. Um, and then sort of a, a different um, uh, pattern towards uh, spring and summer. So these are geopotential height anomalies. So you're seeing strong negative anomalies uh, aloft in the early part, and then more positive anomalies and more um, uh, closer to the surface. Um, it's also exceptionally well forecasted uh, event. I'm not going into that, but these are uh, six different um, uh, sort of seasonal forecasting models. And in, in, in several of them, this event, which is this, the, the, the skill of the forecast is given with this dashed line compared to like sort of a, a hindcast was very well uh, among the best forecasted uh, winter sort of, yeah, um, C500 uh, anomaly correlations. So it was like a strong event and, and well forecast. Um, so then, then there's a little bit of like sort of my personal story. I started looking into that together with, with a bunch of these people from the attribution group. Uh, and uh, then I started a new job uh, at Cornell University in fall and really um, didn't get too much in the beginning. Uh, and so the whole year 2020 passed and it turned out that also the second half was relatively extreme. So I decided to pivot a little bit and focus on the whole year and look at what caused uh, this very persistent temperature anomaly over the whole year. So here are daily temperatures over, this is the same box. I'm just looking at land in this box, the same box as was used in the earlier attribution study. And again, you can see that this really uh, compared to a climatology that is 1951 to 1980, almost every day was above normal. So very, very persistent uh, temperature anomaly through the year. Then also leading to a four degree temperature anomaly in the annual mean, which is again, sort of quite extreme, but uh, in general, consistent with, with long-term trends. Um, this is just plotted again here uh, against, um, yeah, a multi-model mean, doesn't really matter which ones, you see at five, the, the, this collection of large ensembles, or whatever. Uh, it's generally consistent with that long-term trend. 
Uh, what I want to point out here is again, uh, these are the monthly mean anomalies over the region of interest uh, for 2020. Uh, so really this like consistent positive anomaly throughout the year at times three standard deviations over climatology. And then in light gray, you see all the other years um, in, in the observational record. So we wanted to tease this apart a little bit more to understand how much of this anomaly was due to internal um, uh, mainly atmospheric circulation variability and how much might be driven by other, by other factors and potentially feedbacks. And we applied two uh, dynamical adjustment methods. I'm not going to go into the details very much. In particular, the first one I've used extensively and presented on earlier uh, that was coming out of work from Clara Desser and Laurent Terre, uh, and then another one by Sebastian Zippel. Um, uh, the point really here is to estimate with various methods um, the contribution of atmospheric circulation and its variability to, for example, temperature anomalies in this case, and try to separate that out. That out. Um, and so if we, if we do that uh, in, with both of these methods, we come up with an estimate of the contribution from atmospheric circulation uh, variability to, well, the entire time series, but more specifically this particular year. Uh, and sort of consistent with our expectation that, uh, that a strong uh, uh, Arctic oscillation, a strong polar vortex influenced this event, we see a large contribution from uh, atmospheric circulation variability in the first half of the year, and then less later on. Uh, and the, the residual effectively we're, we can then use to interpret more as, as a thermodynamic driven component. And we see that this was the one uh, that dominated the temperature anomaly in the second half. So somewhat contrasting evolution throughout the year. Um, not gonna go into too much detail, but you can go in and look at uh, the actual circulation anomaly and, and temperature anomaly uh, in each month, January, February, et cetera, and then the dynamical contribution and the residual throughout the year. Not gonna delve into that here, but that's something you can get out of these methods. Um, and then it turned out that like right around the time, so it was, uh, I think, ultimately published uh, in, in, yeah, in spring 2020, a paper by Wu and Chen, uh, looking at factors that lead to persistent air temperature anomalies. They were just focusing on going from winter to spring, but over uh, mid to high latitude Eurasia. And they sort of compiled a nice uh, recipe, if you will, of some of the ingredients they think are important. Uh, and they were hypothesizing uh, based on yeah, earlier work by others uh, that particular North Atlantic SSTs are favorable for a persistent uh, Arctic oscillation. In this case, it's not always clear that the strong polar vortex is driven by that, but we definitely have both of these uh, uh, patterns in place. And then also the Scandinavian pattern as a circulation anomaly pattern uh, becoming important in spring. And then also they touched upon the potential for sea ice anomalies, but um, this was sort of like in, in the general sense, but they had done this analysis on the historical record without looking at 2020 yet. And so if you do look at these factors, uh, the North Atlantic SST, it's a tripole pattern. I'm not going to show it here, but particular index was slightly positive uh, throughout winter. Here we see this very strong Arctic oscillation that I mentioned that then goes back to normal values. Scandinavian pattern also quite high in, in certain instances. So all of these ingredients uh, were in place. And we also know that these ingredients uh, are important for, uh, for these linkages. And so here I'm showing the correlation for each month between atmospheric, uh, the Arctic oscillation and temperature over the region of interest. And now what we can do, that, that's run in black. Now what we can do, we can look at this also in the uh, dynamical part, the blue part of the temperature. And we do see that uh, this variability in generally is very strongly correlated uh, with with uh, the Arctic oscillation, while the sort of the residual, this more thermodynamic part isn't correlated, uh, just as we'd expect, slightly weaker correlations for the Scandinavian pattern. Yep. Then, yep. Um, and then we looked at a, a few other patterns, uh, sorry, other potential drivers, uh, especially in context of this second half, where we think that the thermodynamic part is more, uh, more important, like the Siberian snow cover, which was exceptionally low during 2020. Uh, then soil moisture, which also had a, a, almost a record minima uh, in, in June. And then sea ice along the Siberian coast, uh, which also was record uh, low in, in 2020. And so those, those factors um, are generally also correlated negatively with uh, temperature uh, in, in parts of the month, uh, parts of the year. Uh, and again, we see that this time around, if we do this dynamical adjustment, we see that uh, 
the residual temperature, so something that we might expect to be more thermodynamically driven, uh, is more strongly correlated um, with, with snow cover, soil moisture, uh, and sea ice. Uh, I forgot to mention in all of these cases, temperature is detrended. So we're like subtracting the long-term temperature effect, which would inflate some of these correlations a little bit. So those are significant uh, in any case. Um, and so then we can go in and try to reconstruct, especially this um, thermodynamic part of 2020 with a regression model that just uses snow, soil moisture, and sea ice. And we can do a reasonably good job to reconstruct this, this uh, red curve except uh, in November 2020, which still causes uh, some headache uh, because the very strong thermodynamic contribution suggested by dynamical adjustment, but it's not easily reconstructed. Um, here's the generally explained variance uh, of this model. Uh, it's also not that high in November. So some, some questions remain uh, in this part. Um, and then I forgot to mention this, like I have a whole bunch of slides um, because I'm sort of working on a, on a larger, yeah, trying to get up to speed with this paper, I gotta unfortunately skip over those um, for time reasons um, and go to the conclusions to summarize this. Um, yeah, we, we had these strong temperature anomalies that uh, mainly grabbed the headline in the first half of the year, but uh, continued on and are quite interesting. Uh, I didn't get to the part where we looked at the model validation which is quite challenging because this is sort of an unprecedented event uh, and like to study the actual processes, uh, which isn't usually done in classic attribution studies, uh, it becomes quite tricky because uh, it, it's in any, in a lot of these observational metrics, um, it's, it's the most extreme event. But generally we do find the models to reproduce these mechanisms. Uh, and we think this can be expanded to include other, other impacts as, such as fire or thermo, permafrost thawing. Um, and I did want to plug uh, this announcement for a workshop that does look at attribution, uh, specifically of multi-annual to decadal changes, which is a bit of a new, uh, new topic. Um, and we're in particular looking uh, for people who work with, with large ensembles and some of the tools that you've all presented on. Um, it's going to be uh, virtual uh, and free, and registration deadline is coming up soon. Thanks. Thanks. Are there any questions for Flavio? I guess I was wondering, you mentioned that the first half year was very well forecast. Do you know how the forecasts were predicting things for the second half? I haven't looked yet. And I, I should also say that this was mostly for the circulation. Hopefully that translated mm -hmm. into good forecasts for, for surface temperature as well and other factors. But yeah, this was the classic sort of 500, 500 hectopascal uh, uh, um, pattern correlation. Oh, I think that is okay. quite... So, uh, I, I'd have to look into that or maybe easier ask these, these authors. Yeah, I think that was uh, Simon Lee and the other paper was by uh, Zach Lawrence. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, if you have any more questions for Flavio, you can um, type them in the chat. Our next speaker is Jitendra Singh talking about enhanced risk of concurrent regional droughts with increased ENSO variability and warming. Yeah, sorry, I just muted myself. <laughs> so my screen is visible to anyone, right? Yeah, that looks good. Yeah. And so, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral uh, research fellow at uh, Washington State University, Vancouver. So I will present some of my work I have been doing in, uh, <clears throat> in postdoc. Uh, so my presentation to uh, broadly focus on understanding simultaneous droughts and uh, their drivers and historical and future climates. So I'd like to acknowledge my collaborator listed here for their suggestions and feedbacks on this uh, study. Uh, so the compound, Sorry. So the compound droughts events are defined when multiple region experience uh, drought simultaneously. So the motivation of this work comes from a historical drought event which occurred during uh, 1876 to 78 when multiple regions which are highlighted with yellow and pink color experienced the drought simultaneously. So it was a multi-year drought uh, which caused widespread crop failure and further catalyzed the global famine uh, which resulted in more than 50 million fatalities. 
Uh, so this event was considered one of the worst feminine in human history. However, the impact from such event may not be same in today's world, but still it may have a serious impact on global food system. For example, these kind of events may affect the food production and which may increase the global food uh, food prices. So from this, po this point onward, I will use the compound route uh, instead of saying like especially compound routes. Uh, so this study explore uh, uh, broadly three major questions. So first we uh, focus on understanding the characteristics and physical drivers of compound drought in historical climate. Uh, second, uh, we understand the influence of projected warming on changes in characteristics and driver of compound drought. Uh, and lastly, uh, we focus on examining the changes in the population and agriculture exposure to compound droughts with warming. Uh, so uh, we study the compound droughts over these 10 regions marked with red solid lines. So basically several of, several of these regions are influenced by global monsoon systems. And these regions uh, includes important broad uh, bread baskets and vulnerable populations then de that uh, depend on rain-fed agriculture for their their livelihood. Uh, so within each region, we consider the only uh, area which shows the high variability uh, during summer monsoon precipitation, which is indicated with teal color. Uh, text and red color shows the fractional area uh, with higher variability within each uh, SREX region. So we also consider sea surface temperature over, Asia, uh, over various uh, ocean areas marked with dashed blue line to define the modes of uh, natural variability. So we examine the influence of these four uh, variability modes on compound drought characteristics. So these modes are El Nino, uh, Tropical North Atlantic, Atlantic Nino, and Indian Ocean Dipole. Uh, so these modes are known to have an influence over one or more regions we consider in this analysis. Uh, so we use observed precipitation from CHIRPS and CREW and the SST uh, from the NOAA, and we also use CSM pre-industrial and large ensembles. So we define a region under drought if drought affected area exceeds uh, uh, 80th percentile of long-term uh, average drought area. And uh, we define the compound drought event if at least three regions out of 10 experience drought uh, simultaneously. Uh, so we identify the specific phase of four variability modes relevant to compound drought based on the observational analysis. And due to larger sample size, so we use the uh, CSM pre-industrial simulation here to uh, isolate the influence of each individual modes and their co-occurrences phase on compound droughts. So this figure shows the distribution of number of uh, uh, number of regions uh, experienced drought simultaneously during the occurrences of individual and uh, combined variability mode, which is indicated on the on the on the x-axis. <laughs> so the number on top of each box shows the probability of compound droughts uh, during each condition. So we define the neutral year when the SSTs over TN and Nino 3.4, Atlantic Nino and Indian Oceans are, are, are within a plus minus 0.5 HD. So the horizontal uh, dash line uh, shows the threshold used to define the compound droughts. So the significant difference in the distribution is marked with, uh, uh, with arrows. So the distribution of drought region during negative phase of Atlantic Nino, so which is like a negative Atlantic and the negative TNA, and during El Nino conditions are significantly uh, significantly higher than that during the neutral condition. So more specifically, the probability of compound drought increase more than two times uh, during negative Atlantic Nino and uh, TNA conditions, and around three times during El Nino conditions related to the neutral conditions. Huh. So further, uh, the co-occurrence of uh, negative TNA conditions with El Nino increase the probability of compound droughts nearly uh, seven times relative to neutral conditions and more than two times uh, relative to El Nino conditions alone. So we find the similar influence uh, of individual and combined modes of variability on distribution of drought area and drought intensity. So overall, we find that the uh, the overall uh, we find that El Nino is the major driver of compound droughts, mm -hmm. and DNA negative conditions has a largest amplifying influence on the El Nino driven compound droughts. Uh, so uh, next we have, like, now we have some understanding about the compound drought and its driver. So we further extend this works to understand the compound droughts in future uh, under business as usual scenario, RCP 8.5. So for that, we use the CSE, C, CSM large ensemble uh, for this analysis. So this figure shows the distribution of drought reason uh, in the historical uh, 
uh, climate, uh, which is defined as 1971 to 2000, and the future climates with the red color, and which is defined over 2071 to 2100. So the number of top of each box shows the probability of compound routes, and the horizontal line is same, which shows the threshold used to define the compound route. Uh, so overall, uh, we find a significant increase in the distribution of uh, drought region in future relative to baseline period, that is uh, the kind of historical period. Uh, so, so the probability of compound droughts increases by around 60% in the future relative to historical period. Uh, we also uh, find the similar changes in extent and severity of compound droughts in future relative to climate, uh, historical climate. So specifically, nearly three out of four compound droughts in the future are classified as a severe uh, compound drought. So since ENSO is found to be a major driver of compound drought in the, uh, in the previous analysis, so we examine the historical and future characteristics of ENSO index and their association with the compound droughts. So the, in the panel A, uh, so the so is the PDF of the ENSO index, which shows almost 22% increase in the frequency of El Nino and uh, La Linea conditions, which is consistent with the previous studies such as Chi et al. 2014 and 15. So the panel B indicate the distribution of compound drought associated with El Linea and La Linea conditions and, and non enso drivers. So the number on each uh, bar shows the count of compound drought associated with the El Linea and La Linea and non enso driver. So although El Linea is the associated with the major fraction of the compound drought, La Linea are also associated with a significant fraction of compound droughts in the historical climate and it further increase uh, in the future. However, the regions they affect uh, may differ. So overall, the frequency of compound drought associated with the El Nino and La Linea conditions increases by 70% uh, in future in response to just 22% increase in the frequency of uh, ENSO condition and future warming. So in future, nearly three out of four uh, compound droughts are associated with the ENSO, ENSO conditions. So we further estimate the population and agricultural and exposure to uh, compound droughts to panel A. Uh, so the comparison of agricultural and uh, exposure to moderate and severe compound drought between historical and uh, future climates. So uh, the x-axis shows the agricultural and exposure to moderate and severe compound drought and historical and by axis source for the future climate. Uh, so however, I will just focus on the exposure to the severe compound droughts. So the agricultural and exposure uh, so, uh, so the agricultural land exposure to severe compound droughts increase almost tenfold in the future climate relative to uh, historical uh, climate if we compare with the uh, uh, one ratio one line. Uh, so uh, similarly, yeah, we see. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so we can see. Uh, so similarly, we see a remarkable increase in the population exposure to severe compound uh, droughts. So we consider the population exposure under all uh, SSPs to highlight the difference uh, in the projected population scenario. Uh, however, SSP five is the largely consistent with the RCP eight point five. So under SSP five uh, scenario, we find that on an average, ten million people per year are ex exposed to severe compound drought, where this number increased to 120 million, uh, like, um, like around 120 million per year in the future climate. Uh, so I will quickly summarize the results. So we find that El Nino is the major driver, uh, which control the largest fraction of uh, historical compound drought. However, the co-occurrence of cold uh, SSTs over TNA has largest amplifying influence on El Nino turbine compound drought. Uh, so the probability of compound droughts increases by 60% uh, in the future climate relative to historical period. And ENSO related compound droughts increases by 70% in response to just 22% increase in frequency of ENSO conditions and future warming. Uh, so, the, so the increase in future compound drought characters result in up to almost tenfold increase in agriculture and land uh, population exposure. Uh, so these results have a several implication for a wide range of uh, uh, climate sensitive sectors such as global food security, uh, reinsurance industry, and also these results have a broad implication in the global virtual uh, water trade network, which involve water intensive goods. Thank you. I'm happy to take answer. And also we are revising the second manuscript, so I would appreciate any, any feedback. Thanks. So there was one question in the chat from Sanjeev asking why you didn't include the US Southwest uh, in your analysis. 
Yeah, so initially we consider the US Southwest analysis, but we, def we consider only region which shows the high variability uh, in the boreal summer precipitation. So we found a really small fraction of area which shows the high variability over these regions. And we use the criteria when at least 30% of that region should, uh, shows the high precipitation variability. So that's why we excluded. And Nicola? Hi. Thanks for the interesting talk. Um, I was wondering if you can comment on how model dependent the results are. If you look at different large ensembles, you get quite different future projections of ENSO. So I was wondering how that would affect this study. Yeah, so uh, I'm revising that paper and uh, we got the same comment from the reviewer. So I'm working on that. So I smile a couple of more model from the smile. And uh, so, we found like a quite good consistency in terms of uh, compound route characteristics uh, across the model, but definitely there are the, some uh, differences in the ENSO response uh, in different models. So we are still working on that. Yeah. So this figure is showing like a same, like a, a distribution of number of drought region, drought area and drought intensity. And so this is the first three uh, box plots for, uh, for CSM and the middle one is for the CAN ESM and last three ones. So we see a like a strong consistency between these models in terms of drought characteristics. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to the last speaker of the session, uh, Zhao Shin Ban, talking about the asymmetry of annual stream flow responses to warming in the Western US. Okay, um, let me share the screen. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Zhao Xinban from the Department of Geography at UCLA. Today, I will present our recent work on understanding the asymmetry of annual streamflow responses to seasonal warming in the Western US. More than 26% of the global land area depend on snow melt as their dominant water resource. Western US is a typical snow dominated region, which snowpack has experienced a significant decrease under climate warming, leading to a significant decrease in snow melt generated runoff. These changes are challenging to the region's social economical safety. Therefore, it is important to understand how and why the stream flow changes under climate warming. The climate warming signal in the Western US is not evenly distributed on a subannual scale. So warming in the warm season from April to September is substantially larger than the warming in the cool season from October to March across most of the regions. As shown by the two figures, three out of four regionally important basins in the Western US have warming peaks in the warm season under two RCP warming scenarios as projected by CMAP5. Considering the projected asymmetrical warming pattern, understanding how the seasonal warming impact annual stream flow would be important for understanding future stream flow change. In 2011, Das et al. discovered that the four basins above generally have stronger streamflow response to warm season warming than to cool season warming, especially the Colorado and the Columbia River Basin. However, the other two basins, North and South Sierra Nevada, does not show such asymmetry. Das et al. did not explicitly explain why the asymmetry differs, and their results are from only one hydrological model. So whether this result is consistent across models is still a question. Motivated by these gaps, we ask two questions. First, whether or not the asymmetry of streamflow response to seasonal warming is model dependent. Second, why the annual streamflow responses to seasonal warming differ across basins. In our new draft and a review at WRR, we also expand analysis to the entire Western US at a much finer granularity, and I will use some of its results in this presentation too. To answer the questions, we use four land surface models including variable infiltration capacity model, NOMP, Cashman, and SACSMA at advanced 16th degree resolution. We fix precipitation and perturb the daily maximum and the minimum temperature and the four warming scenarios to isolate the effect of temperature on stream flow. The first scenario is baseline. The second is three degree warming in the warm season only. The third one only warms the cool season and the fourth one is annual warming. All models are run from water year 1916 to 2018. Here are the multimodal results of streamflow response. From the first to the third rows are streamflow responses to annual warm season and cool season warming. Within each subplot from top to down are responses at annual warm season and cool season timescale. The gray bars are multimodal mean and color bars are for different models. 
we can see that despite the absolute values defer, the models share similar relative magnitude and sign. And the multimodal mean also shows stronger responses to warm season warming in the Colorado and Columbia River basins, while the other two basins has very weak or even reversed the symmetry. So here we answer the first question. The stream flow response asymmetry are consistent across different land surface models. Now we answer the second question. Why the asymmetry differs across basins? We apply a long-term water balance framework where the annual erupt transpiration change equals the annual runoff change. Therefore, we can explain the annual runoff change by um, explaining the annual erupt transpiration change. And this makes it easier than directly analyzing runoff since the evapotranspiration is a more instant and local process than runoff. In the following slides, you will see some subscripts. The first subscript indicates the season, and the second subscript indicates a warming scenario. With the above framework, we can get a proxy of asymmetry, which we call PREF. PREF ET is calculated as the annual ET change under warm season warming divided by annual ET change under cool season warming. And PREF Q is calculated similarly using stream flow. If PREF is larger than one, it means other response happens under warm season warming. If it is smaller than one, it means a larger response happens under cool season warming. If PREF is smaller than zero, it means the response is under the two warming scenarios in our experiment to show the different uh, opposite signs in stream flow response. Based on the long-term water balance, I would expect the PREF ET to be close to PREF Q in any event. And this is confirmed by this bar plot. The first row is PREF ET and the second row is PREF Q. We can see that they are very similar. This ensures that we can shift our focus to the variation of PREF ET. Because the annual ET change is the combined effect of both water and energy supply change, I want to identify if there is a season that dominates the annual ET change. This is a plot showing the ET response to seasonal warming. The first row is ET response to warm season warming, and the second row is ET response to the cool season warming. We can see that under warm season warming, annual ET change is dominated by warm season ET change. And under cool season warming, the annual ET change is dominated by cool season ET change. Both two seasonal ET changes are mostly caused by the season's temperature warming instead of water because the water availability at the beginning of those warming seasons hardly changes in our experiment. So we hypothesize that the relative rank of PREF ET across basins can be approximated by the ratio of warm season ET to temperature sensitivity to cool season ET to temperature sensitivity. To test this hypothesis, we compare the PREF values and the ETT sensitivity ratio here across the four basins using multimodal mean. We can see that the three proxies share very similar relative rank. We also confirmed it across the Western US at half eight level, not only in terms of the relative rank, but also in the absolute magnitude. They are also similar, suggesting that the relationship is quite robust across different hydroclimate conditions. Therefore, if we find what controls the basin's seasonal ET to temperature sensitivities, we can explain why the PREF and hence PREFQ differs across basins. To do this, we choose a series of variables related to ET and selected two most representative variables here, namely temperature and the GIW. The GIW is gross incoming water defined as a season's precipitation plus the soil water and the snow water storage at the beginning of the season. The red points denote the warm season value and the warm season warming for each year, and the blue points are for cool season warming. We can see that for both seasons, the ET to temperature sensitivity and the GIW also uh, show both positive relationship, which is as expected, but the ET to temperature sensitivity uh, with temperature shifts from positive relationship to, to negative relationship uh, in most cases, which will be further explained in the next few slides. The previous slide showed the relationship within each basin across different years. And this slide compares the relationship between the variables across different basins. Under cooler temperature in the cool season, the ET to temperature sensitivity increases at basins with higher temperature. Well, under a warmer temperature, the two variables show different vari opposite variation. Another look at this relationship across the entire Western ULSS also shows a first increasing then decreasing pattern. This pattern has an important indication. For example, in the red figure, the blue points represent a cooler basin and the red points denote a warmer basin. The cooler basin has generally cooler temperature. So it has higher ET2 temperature sensitivity in the warm season and lower ET2 temperature sensitivity in a cool season. Therefore, the warm to cool season ET2 temperature sensitivity ratio for the cooler basin is larger. 
since this ratio is describing the response to symmetry, so a higher ratio also means that the cooler basin responses have a stronger preference for the warm season warming. Such cool basins are exactly the Columbia and the Colorado amount of force uh, answering the second question. We further explain the ET to temperature sensitivity, thank you, variation with temperature by attributing the seasonal ET change to five processes using the Perman Montes framework. As shown in the red figure, the red curve is model simulated ET change, and the brown curve is the sum of the five individual processes contribution. We can see the increasing part of ET to sensitivity to temperature is mostly contributed by the pink and the purple curves, which are reflecting the enhanced rate of water vapor holding capacity increase. And the uh, decreasing part is due to mainly the blue and the ZN curves. Uh, one is the increasing surface resistance and a higher vapor pressure deficit. Another is the snow melt albedo feedback, which causes less radiation increase when there remains less snow pack. Some other complex reasons, please see our paper at the end of presentation. We also discussed the effect of radiation on ET to temperature sensitivity. We only show the main conclusion here due to time limit. Uh, under cool season warming, the warmer basin tends to melt more snow and has larger albedo decrease and radiation increase, leading to a larger ET2 temperature sensitivity. Under warm season warming, a warmer basin generally have less snowpack remain, so less albedo decrease occur under warming, leading to a smaller ET2 temperature sensitivity than a cooler basin. These results are consistent with our findings in previous several slides. In summary, we find cooler basin tend to have a larger annual runoff response to warm season relative to cool season warming. This explains why the Colorado and Columbia River Basin has a stronger stream flow decrease under warm season warming. This pattern is explained by the variation of ET2 temperature sensitivity in response to a compound set of land surface processes. And uh, it has implications for better understanding the future stream flow change under an uh, asymmetrical warming future. Uh, here are my selected references. And that's all for details. Please see this paper or contact me directly at this email. And I want to thank my co-authors and my advisor, Dr. Lattenmayer. And finally, thank you all. Uh, questions and comments are very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Xiaoxing? Oh. Uh, do you have a question, Flavio, or you're you're just clapping? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, I wanted to both applaud and raise my hand. Uh, yeah, very nice presentation. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's really it's really convincing. I think the only question I had, like, do you had these sensitivities? I I know a little bit about them from trying to estimate them from observations, and it's very seems very difficult. Do you? Do you feel like the models are more or less in the right ballpark? And like, how, how would you conclude that? Uh, do you mean the uncertainty or uh, how should yeah, basically, I? Yeah, like what, what's, the, what's the real sensitivity, um, like from the real world? OK, OK. So, <laughs> I know it's yeah, hard, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm using the model. Yeah, I'm using the model in this, uh, in this paper. And we can see they, this model has some um, an uncertainty in their absolute magnitude. And um, the thing for my work is uh, those models are calibrated uh, uh, in stream flow and the precipitation are come from the observations. So um, the sweep simulation mm -hmm. is, is mostly controlling the annual evaporation transpiration, I, I believe. And uh, uh, in terms of whether it's difficult to, to calculate the evaporation transpiration to temperature sensitivity, um, I think it's more difficult in, in observation than in model because um, if we use remote sensing uh, products of Russian transpiration, uh, there are some water balance closing, closure budget error. And uh, it is also hard to explain whether the evapotranspiration measurement is correct or not. Um, the only thing we can, um, we can kind of use maybe the flux towers that can measure the evaporative transpiration. And uh, we can use the temperature measurement too and the, the precipitation and so on. But I'm not quite familiar in that field, but uh, to constrain the variability, I believe there are many methods that can combine with different models. For example, the observation constraint sensitivity analysis, if we can find the evaporative transpiration to temperature sensitivity is having a good linear regression relationship with uh, another variable that is observable in the different observations. Uh, and this relationship is maintained across different like CMIP5 models or so. 
so we can constrain the distribution of model simulated sensitivities using the observed variables to see a more realistic estimation of the ET2 time precision. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So we just have uh, 10 minutes left of the actual session. So we'll use this for um, some discussion now. Okay. Um, so we have, uh, we can really talk about anything now. I won't go through kind of an update because we already did that on Monday. Um, but I have these um, discussion points. Um, um, but we can talk about anything if anyone wants to say anything. So some questions though that we thought might be interesting to discuss is the usual one of what simulations would you like to see performed by the working group? At this point, we're kind of in the middle of the allocation cycle. So we don't need to write our proposal this year. So next year will really be when we'll need to think of new plans, but um, it's always good to keep ideas coming in case we have extra computing time. Um, if you have any issues that you run into in getting CSM to data or CSM data, you can please bring them up. One question we thought maybe needs to be addressed because a number of people, I guess, have asked me about this and I know Sarah as well, is um, we currently don't have a slab ocean that is supported for CSM2. And the working group is going to perform instead of the slab ocean pre-industrial control where um, the plan is as young Kwan is running a pre-industrial control with this new pencil model, which is basically a mixed layer physics at every grid point. Um, so one question is, do you think we should all, we should, should people be continuing to use slab oceans? And do you think this is something that should be supported for each CSM version? Um, are there any particular kinds of experiments that you'd like, that you've seen people do that you'd like to know um, how to do them? Uh, and if, is there anything else that you'd like to, to bring up? So I'm going to stop sharing just so I can see everything. So hopefully you can remember these thoughts. Does anyone have anything they'd like to say? If not, Stephanie, I don't know if you feel confident about the poll. We could give it a go. I can try to set it up while you guys talk. Okay. Hi, yeah. um, this is Angie. I was just gonna, Hi. I was just saying in the chat that um, I'm using some aqua planet slab ocean version of something similar to CESM2. It might be CAM6 beta, the beta release of something that I got from Brian Medeiros, but um, I'm using that for these ITC ZMIP simulations. And um, I think it's really valuable to have the slab ocean configuration. So I would be yeah. in favor of keeping that around. Yeah, I think it's the, um, the getting the Q fluxes to, for the more realistic version. I know that Cecile knows how to do it and I know that it's not totally straightforward. Um, I don't think she's here because she was in the, the other session, um, but it sounds like something that could be done and provided um, if there was a demand for it for the kind of real world situation. I mean, I just generated Q fluxes. You like start with the prescribed sea surface temperature simulation and then you generate Q fluxes. And it's, it's not, I don't think it's that hard. And it's also something that could be, I mean, I think I got Jim Benedict had a script for generating those uh, that I use. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that that should be feasible for realistic configurations too. I don't know if yeah. other people find it. I valuable. think it would be a case of like coming up with kind of the default Q fluxes and then the tools may be more documented so that people can make their own. Isla, I can launch the poll whenever you're ready. Okay, yeah, go for it. <laughs> Not surprising. I'll add about the aqua plant and computing key fluxes. I've done this for paleo configurations and um, there is supported tools for that. Um, yeah. So I agree with Angie that I, it's not, I mean, it's, it takes a little work, but it's definitely something for people who want to use it. It's a valuable tool to keep around. And the tools I think are there. And if they're not perfect for CSM2, you know, I don't see 
why they could not be made, you know, adjusted yeah. you know, with software engineering help. It might be useful to place it in the context of like, what are the competing priorities that, where would those resources be dedicated if they weren't, would they be dedicated to the pencil model configuration? Cause that would be new and cool. And so that's something different. Well, I think um, this is more, yeah, resources are already dedicated to the pencil model. I guess this, is, this would maybe be me talking to Cecile and trying to write a website that would, um, yeah, set it up. <laughs> but so if there's a, if there's a lot of interest in it, maybe yeah, it wouldn't be too difficult. Because I also like Isla's papers. <laughs> <laughs> Isla, do you All have right. an idea of the um, the timeline for the pencil model output? I know it, there was yeah. a question in the winter meeting, but it sounds like it's moving forward now. So I don't know if Youngo is on this, but I think last I heard, I emailed him a couple of weeks ago and they were just kind of seeing if the pre-industrial control was stable. And so mm -hmm. I, it's, he signed it positive that he would use up the computing time that was allocated before the fall. So that would be for the pre-industrial control. And then I don't know if they have plans to um, write a paper first, but I, I think it, probably expect sometime later this year or early next year would be my guess if everything goes to plan. Okay, so it seems like no one does not want uh, a slab ocean model. 71% uh, do, so that, that's pretty clear. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I feel that did something. I just shared the results. Okay, let's stop. All right, does anyone else have anything you'd like to say? There's a question in the chat. Oh. Is is the gray radiation model implemented in the new CESM release? Um, kind of. It's If you want it, you can definitely get it. Um, so yeah, Patrick Callahan has implemented it. It just, it hasn't been engineered into a release branch fully at this point. And the software engineer who is going to do that is busy with other things. So, um, if you want to use it, you can get in touch with me and I can find out what version on GitHub you, you need to download to be able to use it. But it should be coming at some point. It's not in CSM2 at this point though. I hope everyone's gonna go away and analyze the CSM2 large ensemble now. Uh, lots of data and uh, yeah, in case anyone missed it, there's the working group is producing a single forcing large ensemble as well. And the um, SSP245 ensemble is there too. Well, I guess we could start our socializing early if uh, no one has anything else to say. Are there no more poll questions? You have a question you'd like to ask? <laughs> <laughs> I just figured out how to do that on the fly. <laughs> nice. Well, now we have to figure, let's figure out how to fling people into breakout rooms. Right. So we thought well, we do it. I mean, you don't have to stay around if you, if you have other things to do, but we thought we'd just do a sort of 25 minutes or so of socializing and try kind of 